Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. A uh, very warm welcome to all of you. We will start with a small video and, uh, and then uh, we will have the welcome remarks from the director of the World Heritage Center. Can we start the video, please? Urban heritage is all around us. Every city, town, and settlement contains places that local residents value, which have been handed down over time, whether centuries or just a few decades. Heritage is not just monuments. A city is not a monument. The built environment, its natural setting, and cultural practices of the local communities are together what makes cities and settlements across the world unique and diverse. Historic cities have evolved over time. They are repositories of collective knowledge and identity whose value is not in its grand monuments alone but in its urban fabric. Historic places consist of many things, the natural setting of a town, its skyline, streets, ordinary houses, unique methods of using local stone or brick, specialized carpentry or ironwork, waterfronts, gardens, plazas, and public spaces, markets and vendors, processions and celebrations, traditional music, dance, and crafts, all come together in historic places. These different layers of the urban landscape are knit closely together, making historic places vibrant, livable, and people-centered. The identity of historic urban areas, their spirit of place, and these different layers of the urban landscape must be protected as a whole. Every element and layer is important, and so are its connections to the others. But cities grow and change. How should everyday settlements across the world preserve their urban heritage as they develop? Should historic places preserve every ordinary house and square while also building roads and shopping centers? This seems like a dilemma where one must choose between conflicting demands. On the one hand cities, even historic ones, must develop, grow, and change. On the other hand, urban heritage must be preserved for its uniqueness and identity. The Hull approach is meant for plans and policies made with heritage. Urban heritage makes cities more resilient, safe, inclusive, sustainable, people-centered and livable. The Hull approach is a holistic way of making cities better. Become an advocate for implementing Hull in your city and join the UNESCO Hull Network to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the 2011 Hull Recommendation. Hello again. Thank you very much for joining. I'm Jyoti Hosegraha, Deputy Director of the World Heritage Center. It's now my great pleasure to invite the director of the World Heritage Center, Dr. Maxwell Rosler, to um, say her welcome remarks. Dr. Rosler, please. Thank you very much, uh, Jyoti. Um, dear all, bonjour, buenas tardes, dear Minister Nadiem, dear experts from around the world, dear national and local representatives of World Heritage Cities, dear friends. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you today to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the 2011 UNESCO recommendation on the historic urban landscape, or as we call it, the Hull recommendation and its application in World Heritage Cities. As you know, World Heritage Sites are recognized for their outstanding universal value, core to our shared humanity, which must be protected and conserved for the benefit of future generations. At the same time, World Heritage Cities are living cities where ordinary people live, work, dream, and raise children. In many instances, these communities have lived in World Heritage Cities for generations. The 1972 World Heritage Convention is the most universal international legal instrument in heritage conservation with 194 states parties and more than 1,100 properties inscribed on its prestigious World Heritage List. 
about one third of these are urban sites. Monuments are whole cities. Thus, historic cities constitute one of the largest thematic categories on the World Heritage List. They require specific protection and management policies for the more than 300 cities in the World Heritage Cities program. One of the core tools of the management of urban heritage is the UNESCO 2011 Historic Urban Landscape Recommendation. This recommendation approaches urban heritage as a complex set of layers in its wider setting and includes the relationship between a built fabric and its natural environment and local communities. It is thus a valuable tool today to develop solutions that integrate protection of heritage values with climate change mitigation and adaptation measures, as well as inclusive building solutions using local materials and technology. Above all, such an approach values and supports living cities with thriving local communities to make World Heritage Cities unique and vibrant places that seek to include all their inhabitants. Over the years, the number of monitoring reports on cities has not only increased with the growing number of inscriptions on UNESCO's World Heritage List, but also has identified specific problems, including inappropriate infrastructure projects, skyscrapers affecting the visual integrity of historic districts, and pseudo-historical additions to the urban fabric. In recent months, the COVID-19 pandemic has taken its toll and a sudden loss of tourism has hugely impacted the local economy of many heritage sites. As a response, UNESCO has established a special task force for tourism chaired by our Assistant Director General for Culture. The experience of the pandemic has also raised important questions about the planning and development of all cities, including historic cities, with a focus on local economic development to support recovery and well-being. Another major threat is climate change, which is now among the top threats to cultural and natural heritage sites inscribed on UNESCO's World Heritage List. The impact of climate change is particularly critical for the third of the World Heritage cities that are coastal or located along major rivers. As such, UNESCO's World Heritage Center, the Geo Secretariat, and the Geo Greek Office launched the Urban Heritage Climate Observatory to bring together experts and stakeholders from the fields of climate change, earth observation, and urban heritage to help understand and document the impact of climate change on World Heritage cities. More broadly, UNESCO and the World Heritage Committee have been at the forefront on, of addressing climate change since 2005, leading to the adoption of the World Heritage Policy on Climate Change and many case studies on sites under threat. The, co the committee is currently updating its policy on climate change, and you will see that shortly at the session from Fujo. Today's session brings together leading experts and representatives from World Heritage Cities around the world uh, to discuss the application of the whole approach in uh, World Heritage Cities. Projects and practices from cities such as Queretaro and Puebla in Mexico, San Gimignano, Italy, Nanjing in China, Graz and Salzburg in Austria will be examined for their impact on issues of sustainable tourism, local economic development, crisis response and other matters. They will address how HUL has been and can continue to be used to build resilience during the ongoing COVID crisis and in the face of climate change. I take this opportunity to share with you some of the other activities of the World Heritage Cities program. The World Heritage Cities Dialogue has been set up as a virtual platform for site managers and local authorities to meet, exchange and share across their region to learn about key challenges, share innovative solutions as well as relevant policy guidance. The World Heritage City Lab has been developed as an innovative global and collaborative series of events solving the challenges of managing World Heritage Cities within the framework of the World Heritage Convention as well as the whole recommendation. The Urban Notebooks has been developed as a monthly newsletter of innovative practices for site managers published in English, French and in Spanish. Finally, World Heritage Canopy, an online library of innovative practices and strategies that further heritage protection for sustainable development, including the whole recommendation, 
was launched in April this year. I very much look forward to today's discussion, which I'm confident will leverage more culture-based strategies to build cities, to build cities that are stronger, more sustainable, more resilient, and more deeply connected to their histories and their landscape. I wish you all the best for your deliberations. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rosler. We will now uh, have, uh, I will uh, give you a very brief introduction to the uh, HUL recommendation. I know that everybody here is uh, very well uh, aware of, of the recommendation and has been working with it for a number of years, but just in case there are some uh, for whom it is still new, I will um, very quickly uh, go through a short introduction. Uh, next, please. The 2011 recommendation on the historic urban landscape or the HUL recommendation calls on member states to integrate conservation and management of cultural heritage in cities and settlements with policies and practices for um, sustainable urban development. It applies to all historic cities, not only World Heritage Sites, but it's very, very important for World Heritage Sites. Um, it advocates a landscape approach for identifying, conserving, and managing historic areas within their broader context, considering the interrelationship between the physical forms, natural features, and social and cultural values. Next, please. This innovative uh, standard-setting instrument argues for the integration of heritage conservation with urban development plans and processes in order to manage and manage change to protect the heritage values, the outstanding universal value in the case of World Heritage Properties. Next, please. Mm -hmm. The HUL recommendation and its approach has become the standard framework for the implementation of the World Heritage Cities Programme. The World Heritage Cities Programme has more than 313 World Heritage Properties on the World Heritage List that are living urban centres or parts of settlements. The whole recommendation recognizes the importance of aligning with and furthering the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the New Urban Agenda, the African Union Agenda 2063, um, and also the World Heritage General Assembly adopted the World Heritage Sustainable Development Policy uh, in 2015, which is also applicable, of course, to all the World Heritage cities. Next, please. From poorly planned tourism development projects and transportation projects to inadequate management plans and systems, um, there are a number of threats uh, to the outstanding universal value of World Heritage properties. Nearly 50% of the SOC reports examined at the World Heritage Committee in the last two SOC, uh, sorry, the last two World Heritage Committee meetings have been in urban areas dealing with urban pressures. More than a third of, um, of the World Heritage Cities are coastal. Uh, these factors are significant, both for the protection of heritage and for sustainable development. Next, please. In 2019, UNESCO carried out the second member state survey on the implementation of the Historic Urban Landscape Recommendation. Further, um, the recommendation uh, of the or the outcomes of this survey and the recommendations that came from this survey of member states and their implementation uh, of the HAL instrument was uh, the need for reinforcing the implementation of eco-sensitive policies uh, with the 2030 agenda and the urban agenda. So again, the emphasis in, in uh, aligning uh, the implementation of the recommendation with the 2030 Agenda and the New Urban Agenda, establishing monitoring mechanisms to support cities in assessing their implementation of the whole recommendation, collecting and disseminating international good practices and uh, experiences on the whole recommendation, and supporting localizing the integration of the whole approach, integrating tools for impact assessments, use of digital technologies, the slide there, the International Experts Meeting, uh, Heritage in uh, Urban Context, took place in January of 2020 in Fukuoka in Japan to discuss the worrying pattern of the situation affecting heritage sites, as was requested by the World Heritage Committee in recent sessions. 
The main outputs of the, the Fukuoka outcomes was a methodology to better identify urban heritage attributes and a basic framework for urban heritage management uh, that uh, refined on the previous six-step approach for implementing whole. Next, please. Um, the World Heritage Dialogues, which uh, we already uh, heard about from the director of the World Heritage Center, uh, there were nine regional sessions that took place in 2020, for example, that gathered more than 250 participants. Um, these are regional uh, dialogues with uh, site managers that I carried out uh, with uh, over the year. And uh, site managers, focal points, heritage professionals from 83 sites and 44 countries shared their experiences and challenges in uh, 2020. And um, the uh, also uh, uh, to the, the the general management uh, challenges of cities uh, was a major issue was the COVID-19 crisis, of course, and the challenges that that brought to the cities. Next, please. The, in June 2020, the first World Heritage City Lab was organized by the World Heritage Center in the context of recovery and building back better um, and uh, in the context of the ongoing pandemic. This gathered 74 specialists with more than 35 countries, learning from case studies and in a, with a co-creative, uh, co-collaborative approach to developing strategies, five pathways for recovery and resilience were identified. People, first was the people-centered recovery, second, a green recovery, third, an equitable economic recovery, fourth, uh, recovering space and infrastructure, and finally, a digital-powered recovery. Um, and more about this can be found in the, in the, the full detailed report. Um, subsequent labs have been uh, organized in Kyiv in Ukraine on World Heritage Sustainable Development Policy, uh, in the Czech Republic, in Prague, in the Czech Republic, on integrating heritage conservation and planning processes, and the Union for the Mediterranean, and in collaboration with the Union for the Mediterranean on adaptive reuse and regeneration. With rising temperatures and accompanying sea level rise, as the director already pointed out, there's an increasing risk of climate resist related disasters, um, which are on the rise. Um, next, please. Um, also relevant to mention here is a new collaborative activity that we have just launched with the group on Earth Observation, the Urban uh, Heritage um, Climate, uh, Climate Observatory to understand uh, and document the impact of climate change on world heritage cities. Next, please. Building on recent work of UNESCO on urban heritage, I want to recall two significant uh, works here. First is the UNESCO work uh, UNESCO um, Global Survey of culture and, uh, heritage, culture and Heritage for Sustainable Urban Development that was launched at the Habitat 3 conference in Quito in 2016, the Culture Urban Future Report. And um, the second is the UNESCO World Bank Collaborative work on culture in city reconstruction and recovery. Cities are increasingly bearing the brunt of conflicts crises and disasters, which themselves are growing in number. So the framework for culture in city reconstruction and recovery, also called the CURE framework, uh, is a culture-based based approach to um, the process of city reconstruction and recovery in post-conflict, post-disaster and urban distress situations that accounts for the needs, values and priorities of people. In recent years, uh, UNESCO has developed indicators uh, to measure the role and contribution of culture to the 2030 agenda uh, at the national and urban levels that was launched uh, uh, during the Forum of Culture Ministers in November 2019. And uh, these are currently being piloted in uh, several cities. Um, I want to move now to just quickly uh, wrap up with the urban notebooks, which if you have not already, uh, which you're not already receiving, please do sign up to subscribe for. It's an e-monthly newsletter, which uh, primarily aimed at site managers, urban heritage conservation specialists, and those interested in supporting urban heritage um, that includes some examples of innovative practices. It's published in English, French, and Spanish. 
and um, this has been um, it's it's uh, uh, and this has been especially important during the ongoing global crisis due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the accompanying shutdown in allowing site managers and, and uh, others concerned to share their experiences and challenges. And finally, I want to mention the Canopy, a platform of innovative practices and strategies that the director mentioned um, that uh, further that furthers heritage protection for sustainable development, including uh, the implementation of the whole recommendation. So with all of that, uh, I want to end by calling on, on everyone to join uh, the UNESCO Network for a Whole and respond to the whole call for action. You can go to the link uh, here and sign up for the three actions as was outlined by, this, by our Assistant Director General yesterday during the launch. Thank you very much. And uh, we will now move to the next um, uh, item, which is a short video message uh, from um, Mr. Nasser Kamal, the Secretary General for the Union for the Mediterranean. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to greet you on behalf of the Union for the Mediterranean today. About 70% of the Mediterranean population live in urban areas. And we all know that the Mediterranean basin is also a hotspot of climate change. In our historic cities, cultural heritage is a means of local livelihood and development. UNESCO's recommendation on the historic urban landscape, HUL, has proved its enduring value as a holistic approach to sustainable urban development for a decade now. It is tailor-made for the Mediterranean. It brings home to us how to accommodate historic context with new development. It shows us how we can factor tangible and intangible heritage cultural diversity, socioeconomic and environmental factors, as well as local community values in urban planning, design, and spatial intervention in the region. This is why we have closely collaborated with UNESCO World Heritage Center in integrating the historic urban landscape approach in our strategic urban development and housing action plans for the next two decades. We have already incorporated all three actions of today's historic urban landscape call for action into our action plans. In this context, we will continue to work very closely with UNESCO in mainstreaming the historic urban landscape approach across the Mediterranean region. I thank you very much and I wish you a very successful meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we will now move to the message of uh, Ms. Stashka Kedlik uh, Mihailovic, Secretary General of Europe and Austria. On behalf of Europa Nostra, the European voice of civil society committed to cultural heritage. I'm delighted to express our strong endorsement of the vital work carried out by UNESCO to ensure sustainable and inclusive management of historic urban landscapes across the globe. This is why we applaud the UNESCO's historic urban landscapes recommendation and we fully support the related call for action launched on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of this key policy document. We are delighted that this anniversary and this call for action coincides with Europe's major mobilization for improving the quality of our living environment, among others through the new European Bauhaus initiative launched by the European Union and also through the Davos process, promoting the principles of high quality Baukultur. 
let us mobilize at European and global levels to make our cities with their historic urban landscapes more sustainable, more inclusive, and more beautiful places to live, work, enjoy, and visit. Let us preserve our past in order to understand our presence and to shape together a better future. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, so the plan for today, uh, we have a wonderful lineup and we are very excited. It's also a very tight program, so um, we will try to roll as quickly as possible. Um, we had on the 16th and the 21st of uh, June, we had th two full days of, of technical sessions. So the first, uh, there were three on each day, and uh, we have the regional reports from each of these technical, uh, the preparatory technical sessions. So I'm going to request the rapporteurs of each of these sessions to present them, and then we have a round table of discussion after each of them. So the first uh, uh, set of regional reports, uh, I would like to invite uh, the speakers, uh, and I will introduce them one by one. Uh, so uh, the first is from the Asia Pacific, we have Ms. Shika Jain, Vice President of ECOMOS Ecofort and expert of the ECOMOS IFLA International Scientific Committee on Cultural Landscapes. Please, Shika, go ahead. Um, greetings to everyone. Um, I will briefly summarize the key points from the technical session on implementation of the recommendation on the historic urban landscape in world heritage cities in Asia and the Pacific region. Currently, the Asia Pacific region comprises of 46 world heritage cities among a total of 313 on the world heritage list. Though this is a region which has a very rich repository of historic city cores and her recommendations can be applied to a wide spectrum of cities in this region. A general overview of the state of this region was discussed in the technical session, and it indicates some major challenges, such as new development in historic areas, standard of conservation, achieving sustainable development goals, and more recently, on how to integrate COVID learnings. We had two case studies in this session, uh, the Royal Exhibition Building and Carlton Gardens at Melbourne, Australia, and the second one was on ancient city of Pingyo, China. Besides this, we also discussed other cities such as Balat and Goldfields in Australia, Penang in Malaysia, Shanghai, Suzhou and Yangon in China, Kathmandu in Nepal, Varanasi and Hyderabad in India, Rawalpindi in Pakistan, and Bukhara and Samarkand in Uzbekistan. The first case study, the Royal Exhibition Building and Carlton Gardens at Melbourne, Australia is a 19th, 20th century exhibition hall spread in 26 hectares in, a, in an urban historic setting inscribed under criteria two. And the major challenges it faced were development pressures and buffer zone management. The hull tool used by the managers included a people-centric approach developed through a very innovative online community consultation strategy in the pandemic times. Its impact is evident in the successful engagement of the local community in conservation management through an easy communication strategy using a web page, online surveys, interactive maps, and accessible everyday language. This approach not only enabled the site managers and project team to identify and understand the local values, and citizens associations, but also allowed for increased community involvement in site management. It helped in reflecting on existing governance strategy, along with inclusion of citizens aspirations in future planning. The second case study on the ancient city of Pingyo, China, is about a city which has historic fabric from 14th to 20th century, 20,000 uh, population and an area of 2.34 square kilometers. It's inscribed under criteria two, three, and four. And the major challenges identified include socioeconomic condition of the people and impact of tourism. 
by adopting three clear objectives in sync with HAL tools of enhancing preservation, promoting cultural industry, and improving livability, the site managers could achieve the required outcome of improving socioeconomic conditions of the citizens, artists, and craftspeople, continuing to work online even though through the COVID-19 conditions. The implementation involved elements of community awareness, adaptive reuse of unused factories, brownfield conversion to cultural spaces, conservation and capacity building by encouraging restore your own house regulatory guidelines, financial incentives through subsidies, and an improved environment with improved infrastructure and pedestrianization. Both these case studies showcase human-centered strategies that integrate the goals of urban heritage conservation with those of the social and economic development as outlined in the Hull recommendation. Both case studies also demonstrate a localized implementation of Hull recommendation with the balanced use of the Hull tools for civic engagement, planning, regulatory systems, and financial incentives in order to achieve a sustainable urban conservation model. Among the critical learnings from the case studies, it's the use of civic engagement tools in an innovative manner to give voice to the locals. Next. Next, please. The challenges identified include considering the diversity and complexity of living heritage of a majority of historic cities in this region. The biggest challenge remains in implementing the regulatory tools that can address these aspects in totality. Next, please. There were additional challenges identified. The cities in this region are now facing challenges with introduction of modern infrastructure, climate change, and managing of the dynamic data that needs to be constantly updated for these living heritage cities. Next, please. The biggest opportunities in Asia Pacific region cities lies in the recognition of the diverse heritage attributes that need to be translated into specific actions related to inclusive public spaces and improved local economy. Next, please. The final takeaways for Asia Pacific region cities are to develop new paradigms of achieving human-centered urban sustainability in difficult times of pandemic, as we saw in these two case studies, to adopt such case studies as potential replicable models for HAL in Asia Pacific region, and also for the cities to use the HAL tools for implementation, to innovate these and to create their own city model for achieving sustainability. Super, thank you very much. That was a very uh, dense uh, summary. Uh, now we, we turn to Africa. Uh, for the Africa region, our rapporteur is Ms. Ishan Lawson Odiwawa, Vice President, ECOMOS Nigeria. Thank Please you very go ahead. Much, Jyoti. Thank you, Jyoti, and good day to everybody wherever you happen to be in the world. Um, the Africa region presented four case studies um, um, across the continent, uh, across the region. The first one was the historic. Um, town of Gradin Bassam in Cote d'Ivoire, which was inscribed on the World Heritage List under Criteria 3 and 4 in 2012. Um, the World Heritage Label has also uh, turned the city into a world-class tourism destination. However, it faces the challenge of the high demand of um, global tourism and is um, also trying to find a balance between uh, the conservation needs and the economic um, needs um, um, met through tourism. To address this challenge, the city has developed the tourism potential through yearly um, um, events, which also educates tourists about the high cultural value of the, city, uh, of the city and also the respect of the various layers of the um, history. It has developed a good management plan, and it is hoped that this would help to make uh, the city uh, um, a resilient city especially given the very recent um, 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 events of flooding that it has experienced in the past few years. Our second case study um, was the um, island of St. Louis, which is also a coastal city along the Atlantic coast. It was inscribed uh, for, um, 
It was inscribed uh, with the criteria two and four, and it is known as the African Venice for its construction that is highly dependent on water. Um, it has it has developed its opportunity. It has, it, it, it has leveraged its opportunities by engaging multiple actors, both locally and internationally. It faces various challenges linked to bad um, intervention to, um, in, the, in its environment. And this has increased the vulnerability of some of the communities that live particularly along the coast. It is uh, the city management is hoping to um, also leverage um, the tourism sector to meet the economic needs of the community. Um, there have been actions to develop the coast, the artisan village and some coastal selections um, in the site to enhance economic development. Our third case study was the old town of Jenny. The old towns of Jenny, which are both at the same time um, there's an archaeological site and there is a living site where people live and which is developed, uh, which is um, a high expression of urban architecture. Listed in 1988, it was listed with the criteria three and four. It has many challenges, both for the archaeological site, which faces the challenge of looting of um, heritage of uh, archaeological pieces, and also the challenge of, living, of, of uh, facing development we're using um, earthen material and um, traditional construction techniques and the aspirations of city inhabitants to modernize their living environment. One of the solutions that the city has developed is to create um, a new neighborhood on the outskirts of the historic city to buffer between the needs of conservation and the aspirations of the people so that the old city can be preserved. Our fourth case study is Cidade Vela, a small, which is located in um, Cabo Verde, and is a small um, island uh, developing country. It was inscribed with the criteria two, three, and six. Its opportunities lie in the cultural value, its um, proximity to the capital city of the country, and the good housing condition. However, it is faced with the challenge of bad management of local NGOs um, and a, a population that needs um, education in terms of access to educational facilities, and then the constant tensions between the local and touristic interests. There is a high unemployment rate, and it is important to understand how to better use financial and um, heritage resources. Together, next slide please. Together, our four case studies point us towards some issues that need to be addressed going forward in the application of the HUL. In terms of governance, there is a need to strengthen the role of local government in the management of historic cities in Africa. And this will also include ensuring the availability of sustainable financing and investment from the public and private sectors. Stakeholder engagement is important, and this will involve the promotion and strengthening of existing partnerships, creating of new partnerships with multiple actors, including civil society. We also need to give voice to the vulnerable communities in the historical centers in Africa. There is continued need to integrate conservation concerns with urban planning and other relevant sectors so that there is, um, um, a, there, there is some consistency in the various approaches that we um, might want to apply across the board. Next slide, please. A people-centered approach is critical for the development of the for the development and the conservation of historic centers in Africa. We have seen all together, we are living witnesses of the impacts of uh, the pandemic on, on, tourism, um, on tourism across the world. And this has impacted on our historic centers in Africa. So we need to urgently also 
um, identify means of economic diversification and also the opportunities through branding of this um, historic centers. It, as these historical centers continue to attract people from the various parts of um, the countries they are located in, they also present the opportunities for innovation and the creation of new ident urban identities and new forms of expression through the fusion of different cultures. The application of digital technologies for conservation and for giving voice would be important. Um, building a critical mass of heritage enthusiasts will also be important to ensure that conservation um, of this historic site is carried forward because the building of this mass uh, of heritage enthusiasts within the historic center through an understanding of the heritage qualities can also help, uh, can also be achieved through participative, uh, partic participative management, considering the needs of the residents in terms of conservation and development efforts and addressing this constant um, tension between these two. Improving the quality of life of residents through heritage conservation, maintaining traditional knowledge structures in places like Jenny, this is very important and actively engaging with young people in decision-making in a region that over 50% 50, over 50 of its population is under 35 years old. Next slide, please. Well, as we do this, we, we hope that we can together, through uh, stakeholder engagement, preserve the historic centers in Africa. We need to promote and possibly revive okay. some of these traditional techniques and thank preserve you. the layers thank you but if you could just wrap up that would be great okay preserve the layers of history and build on historic models of public meeting spaces to encourage social cohesion next slide please in building our green and resilient cities disaster risk reduction climate action and the greening of this public spaces and the development of our resilient infrastructure to in, uh, will also be important and as we pilot innovative actions to enhance resilience. Thank you very much, Jyoti. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that rich uh, summary. We now request uh, the summary from the Latin America and Caribbean region. Uh, Ms. Maya Ishizawa, Heritage Specialist, member of ICOMOS IFLA International Scientific Committee on Cultural Landscapes is our rapporteur. Please, Maya. Thank you, Jyoti. Good afternoon, you could everyone. Keep within the time. Okay. Yes. Thank you. This is a report of the Latin America and the Caribbean preliminary technical meeting held on June 16. Next slide, please. Eduardo Rojas from Chile, urban planner based at the University of Pennsylvania, chaired the session and recalled the main contributions of the HUL recommendation looking at urban heritage beyond the material and working towards the integrated management of change and conservation. Pointing at a landscape approach to conservation, the recommendation calls attention to the role of intangible cultural heritage and nature culture interactions in urban planning, very relevant elements in our Latin American and the Caribbean ever-growing cities. Eduardo mentioned the impacts of the recommendation in the region in the definition of urban intervention projects, but also noted the incipient impact over the management of heritage places. He mentioned the need to bring all relevant social actors together to decide what to conserve, how, and how to finance conservation, working in a coordinated manner. He also highlighted the difficulties of applying the HUL approach from a vertical and disaggregated manner, and recalled the need to empowering local authorities, transfer functions, and promote partnerships, including public-private. He pointed at the lack of coordination mechanisms and reaffirmed the need to develop and reinforce such mechanisms. Next slide, please. Four World Heritage Case Studies of Application of the HOL recommendation were presented during the technical session, including two of the historical city of Puebla in Mexico by Sergio Vergara from the state of Puebla and Graciela León from the municipality of Puebla, a case study on Guanajuato, also in Mexico, by Juan Carlos Delgado Zárate, 
from the management unit of the Historic Center of Guanajuato and a case study on Valparaíso in Chile by Maria José Larondo from the municipality of Valparaíso. The lack of Caribbean examples was noted and the need to exchange and learn more from the Caribbean solutions highlighted, such as the National Trust Funds and the need to collect to collect case studies from other than world heritage cities. The successful and ongoing examples presented show different spatial and temporal scales of intervention, which work under the, under the principles of the recommendation from a territorial planning perspective with the proposition of a buffer zone to the world heritage property in Puebla, to the scale of neighborhood promoting residents' participation in planning their city in Guanajuato and Puebla, and to the level of the building where the restoration and reuse of a historical building in Valparaíso, urban social life and residential uses were stimulated. Next slide, please. We also noted common issues in the region, such as the depopulation of historic centers, the physical and social fabrics deterioration, a lack of established mechanisms for integrated management, increasing housing demands that gentrification or decay have moved away from the historic centers, tourism concentration in the historic centers, the difficulties to think long-term due to the dependency on political will and political decentralization and a lack of awareness about heritage values. Some common challenges found were conflicts of competencies in the different levels of government, the lack of consensus on a working methodology, good governance, repopulating historic centers, and the lack of resources. Some strategies were proposed to address these issues and challenges on the legal level to develop legislation and regulating instruments to harmonize regulations, uh, decentralization and localizing regulations, on the governance level to foster coordination and dialogue, on the technical level to undertake diagnosis and assessments that all actors can use as instruments for planning, and on the socioeconomical level, avoid tourist con concentration, promoting the return of residents to the historic centers, fulfilling housing demands, revitalizing the historic center, using pub private public partnerships to solve the funding. Next slide, please. From the debate, it remained clear that including people, residents in the planning, management, and conservation of historic urban landscapes is what would underpin the success of interventions. Using people-centered and right-based approaches to the management of change, strengthening neighborhood associations, empowering local communities, and promoting local leadership, and co-creating mechanisms for community engagement. When this aspect is addressed, a more inclusive governance could be achieved, promoting top-down and bottom-up collaboration, coordination among different levels of government, enlarging the funding mechanisms to the private sector, sustaining partnerships. As we are experiencing with the current pandemic and in order to advance Agenda 2030, and address climate change challenges, cities and people need to look at complexity and focus on interlinkages beyond the urban planning and conservation fields, engage with other international instruments like the Convention on Biological Diversity, the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, and address the nature-culture interactions that can sustain the long-term healthy urban rural ecosystems that we inhabit. Next slide, please. Finally, for the World Heritage Cities, the proposition of managing change of the historic urban landscape may seem to conflict the safeguarding of the OUV. However, all concepts and ideas promoted by the recommendation are what can underpin the OUV and be the foundation for the sustainable development of our heritage and other heritage places. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your rushing through. But these have been very, very rich and dense uh, and really thorough summaries. So thank you to the three rapporteurs. We now have a short uh, message uh, from Carlo Francini, site manager of Florence. Buongiorno, I am Carlo Francini, site manager of the World Heritage Site, Historic Center of Florence. And today I am going to present to you the site and its management system. Florence is a city located in a central Italy and it's the capital city of the Tuscany region. 
its historic center has been inscribed on the World Heritage List in 1982. 700 years of cultural and artistic blooming are tangible today in several buildings, monuments and museums, in particular in the 14th century Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore, the Church of Santa Croce, Palazzo Vecchio, the Uffizi Gallery and Palazzo Pitti. The city history is evident in the artistic works of great masters such as Giotto, Brunelleschi, Masaccio and Donatello, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. The Arno River runs east and west through the city and a series of bridges connect the two banks, including the famous Ponte Vecchio, the most ancient bridge of Florence. Here, the concept of the Renaissance and modern humanism were created. To strengthen the site governance, we created the Aerolab, a joint research laboratory between the University of Florence and the municipality of Florence. Some projects are dedicated to a better quality of life, such as the reuse of small forgotten square and space that have a great potential in involving citizens in active heritage, presidium, and the Florence Greenery, a 15 kilometers green itinerary in the landscape of the Oltrano area. Regarding environment issue, the flood risk management plan aims to build an homogeneous and effective framework to manage flood risk. Last but not least, the implementation of an integrated mobility system that includes tramway lines, electric taxis, pedestrian areas and bike lanes is making Florence a more lively, sustainable and well-connected city. Our mission is to make Florence a living, thriving and welcoming city, centered on sustainable development and on the enhancement of the outstanding universal value, which brought to its recognition in the UNESCO World Heritage List. Thank you very much. We now have an amazing set of two roundtables. Amazing because we have the most eminent uh, and most accomplished uh, 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 experts who have very kindly agreed to join us. If I was to go into the bio of each of them, that would take up our entire time uh, this afternoon. Um, but I leave this task uh, to, to manage uh, and to, to be able to harvest uh, the excellent comments to our very able chair, Ms. Minja Young, who needs absolutely no introduction to World Heritage. Uh, she was the deputy director of the World Heritage Center for a number of years and did a lot of work at that time on the cities and historic cities in Asia in particular and uh, was also director of the New Delhi office of UNESCO and president of the Ramon Lemay uh, Center at the Catholic University Louvain. Ms. Minja Yang. Thank you very much, Yoti, and thanks for involving me in this passionate series of uh, discussions. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to um, uh, welcome this great uh, group of panelists. And as Yoti said, we don't have the time to get into details, but we've got uh, leading representatives of uh, institutions, uh, vital institutions, UN Habitat to begin with, with the new urban agenda that is taking the international principles and policy framework beyond the SDGs uh, with, with, with regard to um, urban and territorial planning, uh, Ms. Laura Petrella. And we have a representative of OECD, and as you all know, as playing an, a, a, a very important um, instrumental, uh, instrumental role in the normative and standard setting works of the world's most powerful and perhaps the world's most polluting uh, economies of the world. 
and uh, who, who are fixing the rules of the global economic and social system. So this is an entity that absolutely has to espouse the cause of Hull as part of the uh, sustainable development uh, strategies. And uh, we have, of course, IUCN, the World Conservation Union, uh, again, leading in uh, framing the policies and practices of protected areas management, and uh, mainly, uh, mostly renowned for its natural environment, but more and more over the last decade and more on the built environment with regard to uh, the human impact on the environment. And ESOCAR, uh, the International Society for Cities and Regional Planning, which is federating all the practitioners who are adapting uh, the, the evolution and the concept of the city and regional planning and putting practice into, uh, putting theory into practice. So ESOCARP is also a very, very important federation that has to um, really uh, um, understand and practice how. Uh, and Dr. Nishimura, my dear friend, from the Kokugaiin University of Japan, who is not only a leading scholar influencing many um, uh, uh, research work and uh, policy in uh, cities in Asia, but has also been uh, promoting this heritage-based development uh, all over Asia. And we have my dear friend, uh, uh, Jad Tabit, He's always been one of my mentors, because, who is today the president of the Order of Engineers and, and Architects of Beirut. But he has had many hats and he's had some absolute, he's realized some absolutely incredible um, architectural and urban projects in France, Lebanon, in many parts of the world. And uh, also uh, been an exceptional member of the Intergovernmental World Heritage uh, Committee. I mean, he's not always been gentle with the Secretariat, with UNESCO, but he's been very blunt and very, very, uh, he's always put um, uh, principles before political consideration. So a great, um, uh, we have great admiration for his work. And uh, I understand that uh, the uh, representatives from the African Center for Cities, University of Cape Town is not here. Um, uh, Mr. Edgar Petrese is, uh, apparently he's not here, but this, it's a pity. I am here. Oh, you are here. Oh, wonderful. Great. Because we're really looking forward to hearing uh, how you are managing the very, very complex situation of a city such as Cape Town and then African cities in general. And we have uh, also uh, Roger Vandenberg, uh, the Director of Urban Development of the World um, Resource Institute, which, as you all know, is a global research institute uh, with great influence on governments and businesses. And uh, last but not least, we have Ms. Patricia Green of the University of Technology of Jamaica. And as mentioned earlier, um, in the technical meetings, there probably wasn't enough uh, of focus on the Caribbean, the, the, the difficulties of the managing hull in uh, the cities of the Caribbean, but we hope to hear from her uh, about all of this. So given the very limited time we would we would like this uh, roundtable discussion to focus on the overall question of how urban heritage can contribute to sustainable development. It's a huge question. Um, and the city's resilience in countries where pressing survival issues may not necessarily make heritage, uh, heritage protection, conservation, the highest of priorities. How can we put HAL among the priority concerns in city and regional management? And I turn the floor there now to the members of the roundtable. Uh, Jyoti, I think it's in the order uh, of the agenda, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so uh, starting with the uh, representatives from UN Habitat. Yes. Hello. Yes. Yes. Uh, good. Uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, everybody, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation and also for offering this uh, um, amazing uh, uh, richness of experiences over these past, uh, past few days. So I, I would like just uh, uh, briefly try to respond to this question, but also uh, try to say why for you and Abit that uh, uh, these, all this uh, uh, discussion and, and issues are particularly relevant and for urban development in particular. So uh, on, on one side, we see that uh, the rapid transformation of cities and the demographics uh, and also the inadequate capacity 
to, to manage uh, uh, the planning and, uh, and growth of the city have actually uh, created a situation which uh, is deteriorating historic uh, urban landscape quite uh, severely and uh, uh, put a lot of pressure in any case to anybody that is trying to maintain in the, and, and preserve. Uh, and uh, we, this is uh, um, on the other side showing the emergency of uh, low density, poorly planned suburbia in current densification of the existing city and also under utilization of many urban assets. So I read for instance, industrial area, etc. So I think uh, all this uh, po is particularly relevant for the cities that you have uh, highlighted, the, the ones that have limited resources, but are actually under a, a lot of pressure from this, uh, from this phenom phenomenon. I think the, the historic uh, urban landscape recommendation uh, bring actually a, a very interesting rethinking of the role of heritage and its relation with urban development. And uh, I think also all the, the experiences, exchange and action locally that they have uh, spurred uh, actually offer uh, amazing innovation, amazing uh, lessons. And I think that the uh, work of UNESCO in the, in the global, in um, let's say promoting the global exchange is, is really uh, very important for, for this the discussion. Uh, the role of culture and heritage in, uh, in development, in an urban development in particular, is reflected very clearly in the new urban agenda and also in uh, SDG 11. Um, and indeed, uh, uh, this focus uh, uh, on culture and heritage can bring not only quality, but actually better outcomes uh, in urban development efforts. And uh, um, the, the, the view of the urban, uh, uh, historic urban landscape recommendation uh, of the urban context as an integrated uh, space uh, uh, where social, economic, environmental dimension are, are interacting uh, is very, uh, very important and very um, promising in this, uh, in this sense. Uh, and the call of action, which was launched yesterday, is in our opinion really uh, an opportunity for expanding uh, uh, this, um, this exchange of experiences and also actually possibly also the collaboration between our uh, respective uh, organization and, uh, and networks. Uh, we are uh, aware that uh, static con conservation of heritage may be challenging uh, for both development and sustainability, but actually the concept of uh, historic landscape and uh, of heritage uh, have rather a huge role to play in, uh, in urban development, in urban economic development, in urban regeneration, and in general, in more qualitative development. And I would like also to stress uh, how this is true for the post-COVID recovery. So uh, I, I, I don't really uh, think we, we need or we should uh, con put into uh, a dialectic uh, uh, dynamic, uh, the, the needs uh, for survival uh, or for uh, basic development uh, uh, and the importance of heritage and, uh, and uh, conservation uh, and living heritage, how I like to call, uh, because these are assets uh, that we should not overlook and we should not, uh, um, uh, not utilize in, in the development uh, process. We, we know, for instance, the COVID pandemic has damaged seriously the capacity of cities to leverage uh, heritage economically. I think, uh, for, the, for instance, the tourism sector, which is, uh, which is really struggling uh, at the moment. But also they have shown that certain pattern uh, of what we can define historical uh, patterns in many cases are actually resilient. Uh, uh, in time of crisis and uh, the urban landscape of many cities uh, have proven to be supportive of livelihoods and of daily normality, even in cities which were locked down. I think this is uh, something we, we need to build on, uh, particularly in the, in the recovery from COVID. And also we need to be very careful not to lose the gains made today. Made, uh, today. I want to just to, uh, conclude maybe uh, mentioning how, how UN Habitat is working on these themes. We, we 
are uh, addressing heritage and the role of heritage in development uh, through our work on national urban policy. I think that's uh, something would be interesting um, to strengthen, actually. Uh, we are also working on planning and design tools and processes in urban legislation and in local economic uh, development uh, initiative. And I think uh, in particular, we will be very delighted uh, to um, uh, support the call for, for action uh, in terms of sensitization of the uh, urban development actors. Uh, and we can uh, actually integrate uh, uh, more and more the, the, the uh, the recommendation uh, in, in the work we are doing uh, uh, in promoting on urban regeneration uh, and looking at the interaction between urban regeneration and heritage. We already started this conversation at WUF 10. I think we could further it uh, together with UNESCO and uh, with the various partners uh, yes. and cities that are participating. And Great. also uh, actually mainstreaming further all this work in urban planning and local economic development. I just conclude uh, that we we hope that this, uh, uh, the opportunities created by the COVID-19 pandemic is actually helping us to rethink further urban models and do it together. Um, yes. Will be very important. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I know that we all have so much to say, and we, um, sorry, especially yes. with the <laughs> case studies have been so rich, but uh, unfortunately we only have like three minutes per speaker because our time is super limited. So, um, uh, Mr. Sacco of OECD. Thank you very much. Are you here? Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Mrs. Young. Well, and I think that uh, this moment is really timely to celebrate the anniversary of the urban, uh, the heritage, uh, uh, urban landscape, uh, historic urban landscape recommendation. Because uh, in the post-pandemic scenario, we are redefining the role of uh, public space in cities, and clearly, uh, heritage from this point of view plays a crucial role. Mm -hmm. We understand that, for example, um, the new social uh, dimension that is defined in the post-pandemic scenario and the social distancing that, of course, unfortunately, is not going completely away and will condition our life for decades to come, will change the notion of what retail spaces are, mm -hmm. of what, uh, for example, uh, um, organizational spaces are also from the point of view of central business districts. And in many historical cities, Retail, retail spaces and business district spaces are deeply intertwined with heritage. So this really means rethinking the fabric of the city. And in a moment like this, the historic urban landscape recommendation is really useful. In which sense? Because it reminds us of the crucial role of the community. So it's extremely important to reason in terms of the relationship that today is emerging as more and more clear between uh, culture, heritage preservation, and behavioral attitudes and change. In particular, how important it is today to think in terms of community curate, curation. We don't have a practical means to enforce conservation without the active help of the community. And from this point of view, the only way to involve the community is to really make them feel heritage as an asset that is entrusted to them. The only way of doing this really has to do with behavior and the role that culture has in shaping our attitudes. For example, I have been working uh, for a long time in a city that I deeply love, that is Siena. It's another world heritage city, and it's a city in which actually retail, business space, and heritage are completely intertwined. So my personal memory was on a case in which I went to buy, let's say, a, cup, a pair of trousers in a shop that was in the city center. And when I, I had some small talk with the, the shop owner after the purchase, uh, we stared at a wall. And he was able right away to just tell me the history of that wall, a single wall in the last three centuries, because that wall that seemed like a simple wall was in fact a repository of urban memory. And that's exactly the attitude that we need. Citizens have to understand that in some sense, they are part of historical narrative, because narratives are not simply nice things to say or to memorize or to tell. Stories are ways of making us understand how to interact with other people and how to create social meaning together. So today, for example, behavioral science is showing us that stories are the most complex mechanism of social simulation that we have 
to understand what could be the long-term consequences of certain social choices rather than others. So the point is not just yeah. communication. When we And then I'm going to conclude. The point is not just communication. When we think of storytelling, we think of communication. But when we think of storytelling, we should think of community building. And we should think on mm -hmm. new experiments on how to make uh, these urban narratives compelling for people in their everyday life choices. And this has to do with collective problem solving issues and the involvement, the active involvement of, uh, for example, public artists in shaping collective projects for conservation that in this particular sense can really become catalysts of behavioral change and sustainable development that clearly impacts on areas like uh, health and well-being, so uh, SDG3 or smart cities. Uh, so, sorry, sorry. Of, of course, in the and the and the uh, even life of land sometimes uh, the, the the 15 or even responsible consumption as far as uh, uh, circular uh, economy yeah. models are concerned. Mm -hmm. Thank very you very much. Very good. Excellent points. So uh, our next speaker is from IUCN, and uh, there are two speakers, but I understand that uh, Tim will be available for, re uh, for answering questions. Uh, please, uh, Mr. Gold. Russell Thank Gold. you very much. Yes, it's a pleasure to be here uh, and to be able to share a few words on behalf of IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Uh, we fully support and endorse the work of the World Heritage Center, and we recognize the importance of the historic urban landscape approach. Uh, and, and whilst we recognize that this journey is only just beginning and its potential is still far from being realized, um, we, 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 are, we are doing our very best um, to weigh in and contribute to the sustainable urban development agenda and the nature culture agenda. Uh, we have established the IUCN Urban Alliance, a broad coalition of IUCN members, and I won't talk for long, but I will just highlight uh, seven strategic imperatives that we have identified for ecological urbanism. And I say ecological urbanism, including culture. Um, one is to educate city shapers to foster ecological and cultural literacy among city shapers. So architects, engineers, planners, designers, investors, developers, policy makers, and citizens. We need to ensure that nature and culture are properly, properly recognized and valued. And we are developing the IUCN Academy uh, to assist with those efforts. Secondly, we need to empower communities to foster more participatory planning, uh, deliberative forms of democracy that can bring popular demand for enhanced nature and culture to life. Um, we need to adopt a rights-based approach to ensure that every citizen can realize their right to a clean, safe, wildlife-rich and culturally rich environment. We need to ally with culture makers, poets, musicians, writers, creatives, those who are naturally adept at bringing about whole of society transformative change. We need to fix market failures with targeted policy solutions, urban planning and zoning, but also market-based instruments uh, such as taxes and subsidies. And, and we need to share knowledge liberally through platforms such as the Panorama Portal, some of you may know. Um, there you will find hundreds of replicable, inspiring and scalable solutions. Um, and we need to measure performance. By monitoring ecological and cultural performance, cities can better understand uh, themselves. They can set science-based targets for improvement and track progress. So we're developing this Urban Nature Index that will be launched at the World Conservation Congress in Marseille in September. On the very opening day of that Congress, we're convening for the first time in our history, subnational government leaders um, to shore up support for an ambitious post-2020 global biodiversity framework and culture must surely be central to that. So thank you very much. And I hope to see some of you, if not virtually, then physically in Marseille. Great. Thank you very much, Russell. That was really very good, to the point. And we'll look into your website to study all of it. Now, Isokarp, uh, uh, Mr. Other uh, President, Mr. Elise, please. Are you there? I believe we have not been successful in having uh, oh, him connect. Well, that's too bad because, as I said, very important in making that. Yes, link. indeed. He yeah. was confirmed, but uh, we don't find that he was able okay. to connect so far. So please go ahead. And yes. if he does connect, yes. we will let you yes, know. Yes, let me know. So, uh, oh, my dear friend, Yukio Nishimura, konnichiwa. Yeah. 
<laughs> thank you, Minja, and uh, thank you for uh, for including me in in this very important discussion. Let me remind you that uh, history of uh, how recommendation that was started from the how to cope with the high rise building in in the historic cities such mm -hmm. as uh, such as Vienna or Sankt Petersburg, and uh, uh, we. The traditionally have the core and buffer zone, the two dimensional system to control the, uh, the building, but it doesn't work because even the very far from, from the buffer zone, people mm -hmm. are not happy with the high rise building. So we need to cope with this kind of the difficult questions and the ensembles or uh, conservation areas, historic district, these kind of uh, the idea and planning tools was, was created in the 1960s and 70s, but does not work in, in, the, con in, in the mentality of the people mm. living in historic cities. So we need to work with the people, not just the, the group of building, building the physical form of heritage. So that's the reason that the HAL named the approach, not the concept, because the approach is a proactive working with the people who are living in the historic city. So the whole approach is, is from static plan to the dynamic process of understanding local heritage and from raising awareness to the strategy to build the create very important narratives. But the, the former speaker said that the storytelling and mutual storytelling. So the, the how to perceive the shared value oh, is very important. So the idea is the, not only the building, but also the people who are living in the historic cities to get involved in this discussion. So uh, listening from the reporters of, of the technical session, their they uh, summary, there are a lot of words like a dialogue, stakeholder engagement, and people-centered approach, all related to, to the people. So I think this kind of a human-centered approach to get uh, some scenario, to set up the, some strategy to to get the consensus of, of the, the how. Because the, the word land, landscape is very, very symbolic because you cannot preserve the landscape. They need the intervention of the pe people. Mm. So that, that's the key point of the how approach. So we, we and uh, so the presentation and the reporter's work is to, get involved, the people. That's yeah. uh, my observation. Thank you very That's much. Good. Thank you very much, Dr. Nishimura. So now we have Jad Tabet. Where are you, Jad? I'm here, Minja. OK, great. <laughs> great to see you, Jad. Thank you, so, you, have thank so you much for inviting me. And thank you, Minja, for your warm presentation words, which, frankly, I don't deserve. I would like to highlight shortly two issues which seem to me of particular importance in the HAL approach. First, this approach represented an epistemological turning point as compared to the traditional conservation principles that consider cities as a group of buildings, as is the case in the text of the World Heritage Convention, or as a mere setting which should not be out of scale as stated in the Athens Charter. Although the ideas behind the HAL approach were largely shared among scientific and academ academic community, it was not easy 10 years ago to convince all actors in the World Heritage Convention of the validity of this new approach that challenges old conservation principles. This reluctance, or let's say this resistance to adopt the HAL approach was further exacerbated by several cases where the extension of the notion of historic urban heritage 
beyond the limit, the limits of the traditional core or buffer zones to include the broader urban context. This extension created a suspicion among several state parties that this new approach will limit their freedom in the management of their World Heritage Sites. Uh, the former speaker spoke about Vienna and St. Petersburg. I would like to add other examples, Cologne, uh, Liverpool, Dresden, and other cities. However, other examples proved how the HELL approach could open new perspectives for the World Heritage Convention for the conservation of urban heritage at large. Uh, this was the case, for example, for the inscription of the shared heritage of Rabat, modern capital and historic city, Rio de Janeiro, Carioca landscape between the mountain and the sea, and other sites that were inscribed, there could not have been inscribed if they were not based on the Hell approach. The second issue I want to highlight is that the Hell approach extends the notion of urban heritage to include social and cultural practices and values and the intention, intangible dimensions of heritage as related to the diversity and identity. This approach is in line with the principles defined in Mara document on authenticity that considers cultural diversity as an essential aspect of human development and allows to broaden to broaden the notion of heritage beyond the classic, classical tradition used to define heritage, heritage based on the notion of historic monuments. Our cities today are composite, and it's not possible to introduce a rupture between historic centers and the rest of the city. The conservation of urban heritage should be based on a comprehensive strategy which integrates the larger goals of sustainable development at the scale of the city at large. Right. Mm -hmm. The adoption of the recommendation on historic urban landscape by UNESCO General Assembly 10 years ago provided a solid basis for the development of such comprehensive strategies in all urban contexts whether inscribed or not on the World Heritage List. We found it to be a very effective tool for the reconstruction of Beirut neighborhoods hit by the force of August blast 2020, based on the mobilization of local community, civil society, NGOs, and with the help of international community, UN Habitat, UNESCO, and other international agencies, in a context where the Lebanese state is almost totally absent and where the tough economic and financial crisis limits the possibility for the private sector to launch large-scale interventions. Yes. Finally, the Beirut Urban Declaration, launched by the Order of Engineers and Architects in Beirut, together with universities and civil society organizations, defined the road for a comprehensive, comprehensive reconstruction strategy of this uh, 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 neighborhoods hit by the blast based mm. on the HAL approach. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we could hear more and more of this. It's so fascinating, but uh, we're uh, constrained by time. Has um, uh, Mr. Edgar Pietre of the African Center for Cities and University of Cape Town, he's here, isn't he? Yes, I am. Yes, yes please, please. Thank you. Glad you're here. Thank you, yep, thank you, minutes. and uh, yep, thank sure. you for the opportunity to, to participate on the panel. Um, and uh, I'll just kick off as an African on this panel and respond to that regional report and the opening statement about some of the global framing documents, particularly Agenda 2063 um, and its vision. And at the heart of that lives this idea that the way Africa is gonna confront its big questions in the 21st century is by figuring out how to marry questions of indigenous knowledge and culture with the knowledge economy. And this presents a really fascinating opportunity. And of course, if we locate our debates within that context, I think it offers some interest to be rooted in a deep cultural understanding and knowledge, but also to be technological, technologically open and to anticipate what could be alternative futures. Now, the starting point, though, has to be a very realist account. And I must say what I'm struggling with in terms of the existing framework and the discourse about participation and so forth 
is that I'm not convinced that it is confronting just the depth of the challenges that we are facing, particularly in the African context, when we're talking about 80% of the labor force being informal, when we're talking about 65% of urban residents living in slum conditions, no prospect of formal employment in any way in the near term, and rising inequality despite the absence of industrialization. And of course, all of this is mediated by the city, by the built environment. And so for me, for us to simply say, let's bring everyone together, let's have participatory processes, doesn't feel like, like it cuts it. What really is the power of the heritage and historical perspective is that it allows us to think about how to confront the nerve endings of inequality and discrimination in the city. And this means we've got to really challenge ourselves whether our current deliberative model is too beholden to a Habermasian ideal of consensus and whether we shouldn't rather be thinking of, um, of, of, of dissensus to some extent and the importance of, 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 of uh, friendly conflict to really get to the root causes. Yeah. And so as we go forward using this instrument and deploying it, it seems to me there's two methodologies that we've got to sharpen. The one is to always bring together the diagnostic step, which is about recognition, about recognizing culture, but it has to be recognition connected to the imperative of reparation. Yeah. If we look at what produces the levels of inequality that we see and how that is worsening uh, in ways that far exceed our normative parameters, we have to speak about the question of reparation. But how does one translate the imperative of reparation into a propositional mindset? And that, of course, demands that we bring together a synthesis perspective about the different assets that we've inherited. But very importantly, it's assets that has to figure out how to deal with trauma, how to deal with violence and how to deal with the reproduction of those both in how we treat nature but also how the built environment is inhospitable for the majority of people. So this calls forth I think a, a very different paradigm about restorative justice as opposed to this idea that we can all sit around the table and agree on how to implement the principles of, of, of our right. And so that for me means experimentation and exactly what we've heard today, a proliferation of these diverse approaches that we see around the world where people are really trying to wrestle with the nerve endings of the issues within their cities, their communities, and that we should absolutely not be shy to say that there are many things that are ir irresolvable. We mm. can't find consensus, but we know that the principle of restorative justice needs to help us to prioritize what needs to be done. Thank you very much. Very good, really very good point, because as we all talk about community participation, you know, it's just so much more than these words in every situation requiring an, an absolute analysis and diagnosis, as you said. Yes, uh, the next speaker is um, uh, Roger Vandenberg of the World Resource uh, Institute. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and, and I really want to use this opportunity to congratulate on this, on this great event on the 10th anniversary of the whole, whole recommendation to UNESCO and to Giotti and the team. I think it's an excellent discussion. I, I really enjoyed this, and I think it's more relevant than ever. So up to another 10 year, I would say, uh, with kind of really addressing key things that are at the table right now. I want to make three brief points, and I will stick to the time as, as good as possible. One is the thing that I want to say something about heritage and climate resilience. That is something there is a huge opportunity uh, because historic settlements and landscapes are not just a passive victim uh, of climate change, but have endured many past disasters um, before. And communities and landscapes, they kind of embody knowledge how to cope or, or adapt to disasters. And that traditional knowledge and these transformations, we can really leverage in order to plan uh, for future disasters. And, this traditional knowledge uh, systems and identify their potential in climate adaptation is, is, is really important. So there is a lot of knowledge with the people in these kind of historic settlements and landscapes that we can build upon. Um, so there's a role for local communities and indigenous people often to help us to think how to cope with this. So there, is, there, are, there are solutions um, embodied in, the, in these urban landscapes. The second thing is kind of working actively on using them strategically to kind of build climate resilience into the DNA of the cities. We need to look at policies because heritage protection policies, as mentioned already before, 
they can also be at odd with proactive climate resilience and adaptation planning. Um, I, I recall that, for example, in, the, in, in New Orleans, the historic district regulation do not allow the city governments to initiate streets, streetscape adaptation product, projects, you know, using green infrastructure. So these things somehow clash. So that is, that, is, that is a problem. So if we want to use the embodied knowledge, if we want to bring historic landscape, historic urban landscapes in play as a catalyst for urban development, we have to rethink that. And key to that, I think uh, one of the keys to that is to bring data analytics to the table that kind of overlay vulnerabilities and risk with larger historic landscapes, not only with the single artifacts that we, that we use to attract tourists, but really looking at a larger structure that is kind of, that used to be kind of the base on which uh, cities have been built. So often the environmental degradation is a result of the loss of a connection with the natural heritage of a place. And to rebuild or restore the balance and connection between the social build and environmental heritage of the region, going back to the historical context can really offer strong insight on how to closely link adaptation to cultural values of the people and the region. So, um, um, and I would be very happy to continue the discussion with the many speakers and organizations here in the, yes. in the panel. Thank you very much. Yeah, we must absolutely take this kind of our, um, discussion further. Our last speaker is um, Ms. Patricia Green, the University of Technology of Jamaica, of the Caribbean experience, hopefully. Are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. Everything. Thank you, Minja. Lovely seeing you again. And I just want to say thank you so much, Joyti, and everyone for this wonderful discussion. I would like to bring home two points specifically for the Caribbean region. Um, the Caribbean has 23 World Heritage Sites, of which 10 of these are cities. Um, our very first is Old Havana um, in Cuba. And this was inscribed in 1982. And um, we want to recognize the whole significance of the Caribbean also as small island developing states. So we have um, a population of 2.1 million in Havana. We also have in Dominican Republic, the colonial city of Santo Domingo, inscribed in 1990, which has a population of 2.2 million as well. And then we go to um, the town of St. George in, the, in Bermuda. It's one of the islands, the tiny islands in Bermuda. The population there is 1,700. And yet it has a, an encroach of um, 257, which is actually the entire island is inscribed as the city. So we have this diversity within the Caribbean. And um, we want to remember that it's part of the small island developing states, which have increasing vulnerability and impacts from climate change, devastating storms, hurricanes, sea level rise, and we're even having volcanic eruptions. Now, the Caribbean has traditionally been described as Spanish Caribbean. So we have Cuba, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Dutch Caribbean, we have Curacao, Suriname, and English Caribbean, we have Barbados, Bermuda, et cetera. However, one of the things that has actually caused a number of issues within the Caribbean and its negatively impact resilience is the whole issue of colonialism. And politicians are very reluctant to put money in heritage because there's the impression that this heritage, the way it has been presented for World Heritage and the, the outstanding universal values, the OUVs, are suggesting it belongs to Europe. It belongs to somebody else besides the Caribbean people. And so we are looking at our sites and trying to rethink under the HOL principle of them as being Creole and vernacular landscapes. In other words, it belongs to the collective memory and the collective architectural experience of the Caribbean people. And so we are looking at that as a new way of introducing and presenting the, um, the HUL. Finally, I want to share an experience in 2019 um, with the team. We looked at the um, doing the new management plan for the Paramaribo um, World Heritage Site in, um, in Suriname. Now, this particular site 
only has about 30 hectares. And what we found is a wooden, resilient architecture. And in that, we applied the World Heritage, the HUL. So conducting that workshop, something wonderful came out, which is the word, a la Condre. It is a Saratoga word. The Saratoga people are the, um, the Maroons, and so that word means inclusive. It is really an artistic word representing their intangible heritage of colors and variety of things. And so it was applied and appropriated to this. And so instead of looking and incorporating the 16th, 17th, and 18th century um, outstanding universal values of power marble. Mm -hmm. It was so wonderful to see the faces of the young people being trained because they were of African descent, they were um, indigenous, they were also Asian descent, and just the whole, including Europeans, but everyone came together to speak about this, inclusive. And so I say, let us have a people-centered social resilience within our Caribbean context. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Yes, uh, I think we're really running out of time, but really there was a, such so many points to be picked up from your diverse, uh, from your different interventions. But if there's any time available, I would really like to have a quick exchange over an issue of this uh, people-centered approach and the community participation. Because as uh, many of your speakers said, uh, you know, it, there, it's much, it's, it's very, very complex. I mean, the Hull approach, because it, it has to have a deep local knowledge. It cannot, it just cannot have a top-down approach. But at the same time, without the top-down, you cannot expect the bottom up because the reality of many, many local situations is it's just not, uh, it, it, it cannot be, problems cannot be resolved from a merely bottom-up approach. So for mm -hmm. entities yeah. like UNESCO and others, whose job it is to provide uh, guidelines or assist governments and local authorities to provide guidelines. What can the process be? I mean, how can HAL really uh, be implemented in countries with very, very limited resources without the expertise? Does um, anybody want to say anything about this, about the realities of Ninja. HAL? Yeah, we Minja, no maybe um, I think we may not have time for discussion yeah. right now, okay. but if it's okay with you and with the other panelists, at the end of the session, if we are able to accumulate some time, maybe we could open up for discussion then. Would that work? Yeah, that's great. It's, we hope we have some time. It, there's, because yes. there's so many exciting uh, subjects to be you know, discussed further. Absolutely. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, all the speakers. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. First of all, a very big thank you to Minja. And if you could keep your uh, photo, your your screens on for one minute, the cameras on. We would like to take a family photo, if that's okay with you. Um, if I uh, thank you so much. Um, we would. Uh, I just really want to thank all the speakers. Uh, you know, there have been so many rich uh, insights that you've shared with us. It's uh, we're we're carefully recording it and taking notes, and and uh, we'll digest all of this and try to come out uh, with some points, even to share with you at the end of this session. So we are madly uh, trying to to make sense of everything, um, and then uh, we will uh, be in touch with you on it later. And hopefully we will have time for discussion. But thank you very much, Minja, for this very dense and managing this very intense session uh, so ably and so gracefully. Thank you very much. We will move now to the video of uh, the um, uh, Kulturil uh, Ergfold, uh, which is uh, in the Netherlands, which is from the Netherlands. So we move to that. Thank you. The video message, please. Dear participants to UNESCO's Hull Anniversary event, in this short video message, I want to elaborate on the concept of integrated conservation and the way we deal with that in the Netherlands. Integrated conservation is one of the key concepts in the Hull approach. It aims at creating favorable conditions for survival of historic features by means of spatial planning. Thus, 
linking heritage conservation to the social agenda and positioning heritage to accommodate current societal needs. My former colleagues Fritz van Voorden and Peter van Dunn, when assisting them in drawing the nomination files for Paramaribo's World Heritage Listing in the 1990s. By that time, integrated conservation was widely practiced in the Netherlands through a huge program of inner city renewal. In this program, heritage was positioned in a strategic way to revitalize these inner cities that, at that time, all without exception, were in a very dilapidated state. Amsterdam, currently a prestigiously listed World Heritage property, is a good example. Today, we may observe the city of Amsterdam to be exceedingly vital, a place where people like to live, to work and to pass leisure time. But that has not always been the case. In the 1970s and 80s, the city of Amsterdam was in dire fate. Residents moved out, investments did not materialize, and visitors should be aware of the many no-go areas. In the process of inner city rehabilitation, heritage was positioned as a strategic asset, not with the central aim to conserve, but as a means to recreate a vital city center. This worked out very well, as today the city of Amsterdam is in better shape than it has ever been in its entire existence of almost 750 years. When asked by colleagues abroad to assist in comparable rehabilitation processes, we further analyzed the Dutch experience. Jointly, we developed a quick scan method for the historical urban landscape, aiming at defining development potentials that can provide a base of existence for the heritage at stake and, at the same time, define foreseen development threats to the heritage. By putting these development opportunities and risks to a map, we offer a base for spatial planning, providing legal security and continuity to the investors. The city of Samara, currently nominated by Indonesia for World Heritage Listing, is one in a row of many examples. We may conclude that Hull offers a solid base for socially sustainable future. Thank you very much. We now have a short video message from Mantoa and Savionetta in Italy. Welcome to Palazzo Te palace located in Mantua and part of the Mantua and Sambionetta World Heritage Site. One site, two places, like two sides of the same coin. Mantua and Sambionetta are located in the north of Italy and belong to the UNESCO World Heritage List since 2008. They are a serial site and are complementary. You can't understand one city without knowing the other. Both cities are outstanding examples of urban, architectural and artistic element, typical of a Renaissance, and share a deep relationship with the Gonzaga Ducal family, one of the most important and most powerful families of the age. Sabionetta and Mantua are two different examples of the typical town planning of the time. Sabionetta is a new, newly founded town based on the concept of the ideal city, while Mantova is the transformation of an existing town. Thanks to these peculiarities, both cities have played a fundamental role in the diffusion of the Renaissance culture within Europe and abroad. Some of the greatest artists of the time, like Giulio Romano, Leon Battista Alberti, Andrea Mantegna and Vincenzo Scamozzi, have worked in both cities, all enlisted by Gonzaga's family. The UNESCO office is committed to actively preserve and promote the site, in compliance with the management plan that has recently been updated, adopting a more particularly integrated approach, including communities and stakeholders. We are creating the first Mantua and Sabionetta Heritage Center, just in the center of the city, that will be acting both as interpretation and visitor center. Welcome to Ducal Palace, a 
monument located in Sabioneta, in part of the Mantua and Sabioneta World Heritage Site. One side, two place, like two sides of the same coin. We have worked on building a unique identity and on strengthening the connection between the two cities. Mantua and Sabioneta are only 40 kilometers away, one from the other. A journey you can take by car, bus or bike. Cycling along the path that connects the two cities is a wonderful experience. The path runs through the stunning countryside and we have just implemented new bike signals. Traveling between the two cities you can also admire impressive Gonzaga style hamlets where mineral ranches of the family used to spend their time. The landscape, a huge plain, is also characterized by the presence of three different rivers, Mincho, Olio and Po. Since 2008, we have adopted the indication stated in 1972 Convention on the transmission to future generations of the cultural and natural heritage. This means involving school and their students in order to spread the knowledge of the world heritage, in particular the Mantua and Sabioneta site. The UNESCO office has created an educational school project dedicated to the specific site, to the world heritage and the, to the UNESCO values in general. It also organized workshops involving students to engage them to the preservation of the heritage for the future generations. The office arranges visits to the city of the site, meetings and school lessons related to the world heritage and the UNESCO's mission statement as vehicle of peace, eradication of poverty, sustainable development, intercultural dialogue, all throughout education, the science, culture, communication and information. Thank you very much. We now move to uh, the second set of regional reports from the preparatory technical sessions. And I'm very delighted to have with us um, uh, Ms. Carola, Dr. Carola Hein, full professor and chair, History of Architecture and Urban Planning, Delft University of Technology, who will the rapporteur for the sessions uh, for the, the session on Europe and North America region. Carola, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. And thanks a lot to the prior speakers who've made already excellent points. So it's uh, tough to follow up after such an excellent, um, in, in such an excellent event. I would like to try and bring together the presentations from four cities and draw a few ideas from that. So we discussed in the, the session four the municipality of Graz, Salzburg, Durham, Castle and Cathedral, and the historic center of uh, Urbino. Now, I think each of these presentations gave us some insights in what great efforts cities already do and what can also be inspirational for others. So when we look at the uh, case of Graz and Schloss Eggenberg, um, we see the interconnection within a city of two sites. And one of the challenges that was picked up there is how to create a connection between these heritage sites while also responding to security challenges. And so the question of how to design public space, high quality public space, sustainable public space, I think is a theme that we can really focus on and learn from, including questions of barrier-free active mobility. Now, looking at the case of Salzburg, um, we have another addition in the findings here. In every case, we have interesting points about the revision of management plans, for example. Here, mass tourism, traffic problems, infrastructure were big themes, but also festivals and cultural events. What we could really learn from the case of Salzburg is a case study in, in Mühlen, uh, where community and communication stood central and also several approaches toward data collection to really make a link between what's happening on the ground and what can, can be learned from it. Perhaps the most striking message from that um, communication was only a permanently inhabited city is resilient. Now, when we look at the case of Durham Castle and uh, Cathedral, 
it's always about balancing interests and uh, uh, Edgar Peterson made an excellent point about it, is how do we deal with those competing interests? And here we have in Durham, we heard also from people from the city, but also from citizens who engaged with public consultations, the neighborhood planning forum for the city of Durham. So concrete um, examples of the, on the ground of an iterative process of consultation and how that can take place, which grew from the ground up, which I think is very important. And uh, taking into account that Durham is part of a living, modern, evolving city. And I think that's another important point to take along. How do we deal with all the other activities going on around the heritage sites? So legislative framework, policies, and balancing urban and natural areas were another part of the takeaway points. And similarly, in the case of Obino, we talked also about the relationship, or Obino presented the relationship between the urban and the natural environment, the, in the case of organic agriculture, for example, which makes another point about the importance of relating the um, two parts, the city and its environment, and embedding this also into inclusive cultural natural heritage protection. So the question of um, uh, agricultural protection and development was a key one. Now, looking at the Miro board that, uh, and, and central takeaway points, um, I've tried to summarize them here, and we have heard already a bit about similar points, but long-term planning and governments is certainly one, coming up with holistic approaches, partnership, uh, partnerships, but also evidence and data-driven ones with a clear focus on where do we find funding. There's a lot to be done, not only within planning, but also in architecture and urban design. I mentioned high quality public spaces already, balancing conservation and development, having appropriate and comprehensive planning tool so that community engagement, livelihood, uh, local revenues are actually possible. So this whole element of sustainable development around themes such as food, energy, water, I think is an important one, taking into account both local part uh, particularities and the city territory connection. You also asked, okay, what are the takeaway points to further expand on this? So we've heard all these great examples, what is already being done, where can we learn from, who can we turn to, which cities have experience with this. Now, building on the um, conversations that we just heard before, it seems important to me to highlight a few things that might merit to be further discussed. So questions of diversity, multiplicity, social justice, taking into account diverse communities. And in, like in the case of Obino, say we have a lot of students, migrants, so how do we deal with those kinds of very different participants in that larger community? It was already mentioned that we are not only dealing with trying to bring everybody on board to support everything, but um, more important to actually say, we also need to connect to different uh, business communities, large industrial areas that are next to them. So how do we engage these par partners with conflicting interests and how do we find tools to bring them together? And I think that would be my, my another point to really focus and, and Giorgio already made a point about measurements, tools to find ways to concretely assess what is going on in all its relationships and to bring that into stories, narratives, imaginaries to also address and contextualize uh, conflicts. And for me, this requires what is already embedded in how a real multi-scalar ecosystem approach to understand the network relationships of heritage. So for example, to discuss the Mediterranean Sea or the Northern Sea as a focus for heritage, which is one of the points that the Union for the Mediterranean is currently discussing in terms of its um, action plan. And maybe the last point that is, to understand in all of these complexities, also the forward looking elements. We don't yet know what the next COVID-19 will, we're still struggling with COVID-19, 
but to acknowledge the challenges of disasters, terrorism, digital development, and to both understand them at the local and at the global level and learn from heritage because all of our great cities have dealt with these kinds of um, events in the past. And there's a lot to be learned both from the spaces, the social and the cultural developments in them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your excellent summary and thank you for keeping, thank you for staying late with us. I know you have another appointment that you have to run to. So a very big thank you to you, uh, Carola. And we move now to the Arab states. Uh, we are very delighted to have with us uh, Ms. Uh, Eman Benani, uh, Director of the Rabat School of Architecture, International University of Rabat. Thank you, Jyoti. Thank you very much. I'm going to try to give you a summary of my presentation uh, because I, I, I wanted to make a presentation uh, just to remind you of the Hull activities and things that we are doing uh, to uh, protect the World Heritage uh, Sites and, the, and everything that's related to the Agenda 2030. The president of the session has already actually given us the example of Bahrain, where we saw the focus on improving the living conditions of the citizens and also on stabilizing the population. Other lessons I think that can be drawn from this, also the, the uh, involvement of the local population during the program, in involving the private sector and setting up a communication strategy, etc. So, Three or four of these can be actually, uh, I've been uh, three, four cases from the World Cultural List have been mentioned, and some of them were in the Arab world and some were in Europe. These three or four cases, I think, show different approaches to conservation and preservation of the urban historic uh, landscape. And uh, without, within a specific landscape, in specific situations. For one example, for, for example, in Strasbourg, is looks at looking at looking looks at nature and the um, natural environment and how that can actually be protected to preserve not just the um, the built. Uh, areas, but also the natural areas, trying to improve the quality of life for the inhabitants. The second case is, 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 is the old centre of Cairo, and that looks at the revitalisation of a particular area, which is, and looks at how the uh, how the, the population can actually be, work along in partnership on different activities, creating, for example, a community centre. The third case was the, Carp the, the Carthage uh, archaeological site, which has suffered the negative impact of a rapid urbanization process, which was not properly controlled. That has lead, led to certain limitations. Initiatives have said, been set up to, open, to create an open working group on how to apply the Hull recommendations on this site. The aim is to sen sensitize pe people and make people aware of the importance of this and to work together to improve the, uh, the preservation of Carthage. From these activities, we can see that when we are actually drafting such strategies for conservation of, the, of our heritage, we've got to, first and foremost, we've got to actually think about how we can uh, see the Hull as an in, uh, in an integrated manner and in how we can actually develop legal and administrative tools to enable us to have a long-term program and a long-term management system and also conservation uh, projects have got to be thought about as how they can actually be um, um, embraced by the local community because we need to ensure that the local population is part of the decision making process that would enable them to improve their their lifestyles and their their living standards it creates a whole new socioeconomic dialogue and and dynamic and also means that they are people are much more in, um, engaged with their cultural surroundings and appropriate this more another important element is is how we can develop partnerships and how we can actually invite other sectors from the private, other bodies in the private sector, that was also mentioned by another speaker, to enable us to actually continue with financing so that we can systematically open uh, possibilities for management and uh, 
uh, working together, working, bringing all the stakeholders together to work uh, to work on, um, a, a, as one. We've also got to then look at the different levels of and layers of uh, of our heritage, whether it's the built-up areas, whether it's the natural areas, whether it's the um, tangible or intangible cultural areas. And we've also got to have strategies which are targeted at proper uh, awareness raising and communication. We've also got to ensure that we look at risk management when we're looking at hull uh, pro um, recommendations, and this is particularly for the coastal or the uh, the um, cities or cities on rivers. Thank you very much. I hope that was short enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, short and rich, and you really synthesized amazingly the wealth of, of case studies that we had. So many, many thanks to you. Uh, we now move, we had another session uh, of the Europe North America region, a second session. And um, we have on the program Ms. Carol Westrick, who was uh, to be the rapporteur, and she was the rapporteur during the session. Uh, but unfortunately, she was not able to join us today uh, due to a uh, unforeseen uh, situation. Uh, and um, Ms. Mary Noel Turno very kindly agreed uh, to uh, to serve as a rapporteur uh, in her place. Uh, Mary Noel is the director of WITREP, Category 2 Center, and uh, uh, has been engaged in the uh, whole recommendation since its uh, inception uh, uh, when she was working here at uh, the World Heritage Center at UNESCO. She's also a member of ECOMOS and CV and ECOMOS Landscape Scientific Committee. Mary Noel, over to you. Thank you very much, Jyoti. Hello to, to all, and I hope I'll be um, faithful to, to um, uh, Carol's um, report, which was very, very rich. So um, you gave Jyoti the introduction to the, the session, which was chaired by Mrs. Tengalia uh, Copiandro Bea. Uh, she presented some, some main key, key points. And the um, session focused on three case studies, uh, Mantua, uh, University of Coimbra, and the Historic Center of uh, San Gimiano. Uh, let's note that these are all were heritage sites, and also that rather small scale cities, which is uh, quite important also. So as you see on the PowerPoint presentation, there was kindly uh, provided to me by the World Heritage Systems team, some of the key points. So the, this issue of layering of heritage values and the fact of asking what are those values, asking whom, rethinking them and, and discussing them. Again, uh, the, the main key point of strengthening local capacity development, so capacity competency, which is important, a major one, social role of World Heritage values, uh, resilience, livelihood, which we can link to the to the SDGs and the agenda 2030. Of course, the issue of governance, and we've seen in many uh, state of conservation reports, the lack of governance, the lack of management is uh, a key one. And again, local communities and stakeholders at large to be uh, in, involved and in participate development. Could you go to the next slide, please? Uh, so Mantua and Sabionetta in uh, in Italy is a, a true voice um, presentation. So again, an interesting case of looking at uh, what are the assets of these two cities and a focus also on, on rivers and water and heritage. This is a, a point we should also stress. There wasn't that many presentation looking at um, riverine or water water heritage. So again, this issue of uh, innovative planning strategy uh, to look at the broader landscape. We can also say that in this session, there was um, a, a commitment to a long-term focus. And that again is extremely important. Another key point, which is really in the, in the whole approach is the, the partnerships and looking at uh, institutions for, for project development. Um, Another point which our colleagues for Ayushin also stressed is the, the link um, bridging urban development and the, and the environment and looking how they can uh, serve, serve each other. And again, for both cities, um, looking at 
capacity development and social capacity through uh, strengthening the institutional capacity in, in both cities. So that was uh, one of the key points. Could you? Yes, thank you. So um, Coimbra, uh, University of Coimbra, it's in a way, uh, let's say, an old World Heritage Site, but it was also extended recently in uh, 2019. And as a university, one of the oldest in, uh, in Europe, as you know, it also decided it, it had also to consider this issue of uh, tourism and uh, looking at different flows. And to do that, it was a very interesting experiment to look at the uh, intangible and cultural heritage of, of literature. So also developing. So on one hand, it was a very clever way of enhancing types of heritage, which were probably not as well enhanced before, but also a way through a, a tour, through um, a route, a way of uh, developing new, new itineraries, which was uh, interesting. Again, this idea of involving the local communities and, and, and stakeholders, and also the capacity of, uh, of consultants. Um, of course, protection of built and natural heritage. Next one was also on the historic center of San Gignano, which was probably one which um, focused on the link between the city and its environment and the rural area. Now, that is extremely important. Uh, also looking at how to diversify flows, but also an economic element. So again, new strategies, looking at more stakeholders, beneficiaries, one could, one could say, one could say that. And so if we look at, so there was also a very rich discussion in Q&A, and also this wonderful tool you put together, the World Heritage team with the, the, the Slido and the, and the poll. So Carol uh, also stressed the challenges uh, working with many stakeholders, the issue of finance and resources, sharing values, development pressure, climate change, and also uh, the current sanitary crisis. So opportunities, and she was, it was interesting that she, you know, there's very simple challenges and opportunities, uh, more participatory and inclusive, rural again, young people, and the connection to historic greens and rivers, enhancing public space, and new forms of collaboration and partnership, and again, sustainability, livelihood, focusing on, on people and, and looking at the, the social aspect of, of heritage and values. That's it. And again, I hope I was um, faithful to, to Carol's work. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was not that was far more than uh, faithful. You did a lot of uh, your own uh, inputs uh, there as well as you were very much part of the session. So thank you again very much, Mary Noel, and especially for helping us uh, in the very last uh, minute. Um, I want now to turn to a, a video message from St. Petersburg, Mr. Sergei. Makarov, Chief of the Committee for the Estate Preservation of Historical Cultural Monuments, St. Petersburg. Dear colleagues, I'm very glad to celebrate with you the 10-year anniversary of Historic Urban Landscape UNESCO recommendations. This is a very special and important document which allowed us to preserve our heritage for future generations. St. Petersburg is a city famous for its rich cultural background, which has been carefully kept for many years. I hope that 2021 celebration will bring more opportunities to establish new horizons in urban management. Thank you very much. We now have a very short message also from the city of Vigan in the Philippines. A 
as being globally recognized through the UNESCO as one of the heritage sites and belongs to the new seven wonder cities of the world, the heritage city of Vigan established its limelight as a destination for its rich history, culture, and tradition that significantly boosts the city's economy through its tourism industry. Inscribed on the World Heritage List in 1991, Vigan has been recognized as a model of the best practices in the World Heritage Site Management. With the city's rich history, diverse cultures, as well as the resourcefulness of its people and industriousness, it is not surprising that Vigan is very rich in its arts and crafts tradition. These are crafts handed down by skillful generations of Vigenios, known for their expertise in weaving and pottery. These local cultural assets greatly contribute to the demand factors driving tourism growth in the city. Despite the challenges of the pandemic, is home to proud Vigenios, who will soon welcome everyone with warm smiles to the city where traditions blend with the demands of the times. Vegan may have opened itself to change but has not sacrificed the warmth of its heritage. It is the ability of coping with the present amidst the bounds set by centuries-old legacy and the active involvement of its people that makes Vegan a living historic city. Okay, thank you very much. It's now my great pleasure to introduce you to the second uh, roundtable that at, that would that will be very ably chaired by uh, Professor Michael Turner. Uh, Mike has been with uh, UNESCO and uh, World Heritage for many many years, and with uh, the whole recommendation since the very beginning. Um, he's UNESCO Chair Professor at uh, Bethlehem Academy of Art and Design, UNESCO Chair Professor in Conservation and Urban Design, and Special Attaché to the World Heritage Center. Mike, I turn it over to you to manage this session and keep us all in order. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jyoti, and thank you for the UNESCO uh, World uh, Heritage Cities team for this uh, uh, last wrap-up session. So first of all, I'm so excited to see so many friends and colleagues on the screen, although don't see them really, but that this is part of the, uh, uh, the realities which we have. We've got a group of uh, speakers uh, representing regions of the world and diverse institutions that have all got something to say about urban heritage. We've got um, two category two centers, both from the Arab region and Asian Pacific. We've got two uh, representatives from two advisory bodies of ICOMOS and ICROM. We've got two institutions, so the Aga Khan and the Getty Institute. And we've got cities from the Organization of World Heritage Cities and also from, uh, from uh, um, Mexico. I think that this really is that the way forward really is not just simply good practice, but learning from our mistakes and also the state of conservation reporting that we need to prioritize the key actions that city authorities and site managers could take to implement the uh, whole recommendation. Uh, these key actions are critical and needed on the world heritage for generating Article 5 of putting heritage in the life of the community and also in Target 11.4 of safeguarding the world's cultural and natural heritage to make cities safe, inclusive, uh, resilient and sustainable. But much water has then gone under the bridge since 2011 with the historic urban landscape. We almost have um, the uh, expiry date of the, uh, of the recommendation, but this is not so. What we've decided at the General Conference at UNESCO is that we will engage together with the new urban agenda to extend beyond uh, the, uh, the format of urban heritage, bringing it to with other mechanisms within the Uni United Nations family. So we, we, need, we need this to address new challenges, the issues of climate extremes, digital revolution, and other activities which are on the agenda. 
So without further delay, allow me then to open up with our first, um, first speaker. Our first speaker, Lee Menaidus, such a good friend, not just simply the acting Secretary General of the Organization of World Heritage Cities, which she is ably doing, but she also was Deputy Mayor in Rhodes and knows so much about the issues of the historic urban landscape. So, Lee, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. And thank you, Jyoti, for your kind in uh, invitation to uh, for the OWHC to take part in this celebratory event. Now, the Organization of World Heritage Cities had the privilege of participating in the meetings and the years leading up to the adoption of the recommendation on the historic urban landscape. Days after its adoption by the General Conference, the late Ron Van Ors presented it to our members at our World Congress in Sintra, Portugal. We have since devoted several sessions of our regional conferences and World Congresses to discussing the approach and how it may be best implemented. The perceptions of urban challenges and strategies have changed significantly and suddenly due to the COVID pandemic. Two years ago, our main preoccupation at the OWHC was over tourism. In a nearly complete and unexpected reversal, we are now focused on tourism recovery, renewal, and resilience, prompting collaboration with the ICOMOS Cultural Tourism Committee on a project that aims to assist our members in their recovery. In that sense, we must address the importance of a diversified economy. While tourism will most probably remain the mainstay of most World Heritage City economies, it is essential to rethink how tourism will function in a more virtual world, as well as how to avoid an over-dependence on this sector. Other concerns of development and livability remain, but again have a new meaning today in a new context and with new challenges. The whole recommendation encourages us to think beyond the historic center and provide for integrated solutions. With remote work becoming more popular and practical, the need to live close to one's workplace in urban areas might be viewed as no longer essential. We must devise new ways for our city centers to continue to be attractive for workers and residents as well as to create new functions to reuse office space that is no longer needed. We must also continue the adaptive reuse of historic buildings, creating places that are original, that become attractions in the city and that instill pride in the local population. It has been said many times today, but bears repeating more public and green spaces need to be created to offer areas where residents can meet in a healthier environment and to better manage climate change. These measures could in the long run improve the air quality, possibly raise the biodiversity level and reduce heat island effects in densely populated cities. A more sustainable and livable city means also rethinking our mobility, a friendlier infrastructure for pedestrians and cyclists would offer an alternative to the car and conventional public transport, improving the air quality in addition to encouraging people to exercise. So these are just some of the actions that the OWHC encourages its members to consider in their approach to conserving and managing their urban heritage. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, for um, some very clear um, uh, marching orders and key actions which we're going to take on board. And we're very happy that the OWHC is um, supporting it in this way. It's been
The next uh, speaker is uh, Ratish Nanda. I had the opportunity of sharing a panel with him of our world heritage and the amazing work that which is being done beyond the historic centers in uh, Delhi and, and the work which is bring, bringing on board the community in uh, beyond Humayun's um, tomb in the Nizamuddin uh, Basti. I would like with this to uh, uh, ask um, uh, Ratish Nanda, the CEO of the Aga Khan Trust for Culture in India, to uh, take the screen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike, and congratulations to everybody on completing 10 years of this very significant uh, resolution. I remember the discussion that was held in Delhi because India was one of the late signatories. Uh, when Francesco Bandaran had to come down with everybody to convince the authorities. So as you said, a lot of water has flown down the river since then. Um, I think, um, uh, thank you for having me and it's very important to share some of our learnings um, in this regard. And uh, what, what is, um, what is uh, common in our approach at the Aga Khan Trust for Culture worldwide is uh, also forms the basis of the Thing. So we, we understand that conservation is really a strategy, uh, which is a balance between uh, improving quality of life of local communities and urban development, urban growth. Also, uh, the broader recognition um, that uh, conservation heritage can be a leverage to improve uh, social economic conditions of local communities is sort of key to the whole resolution. And uh, of course, of late, uh, the integration of the HUL um, objectives with those of, uh, say, the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, having said all of this, I have three very simple things to uh, point out. Uh, at least in the Indian context, what happens is the historic city centers are very poor and uh, there has been very little upgrading. Now, um, one of the big problems we have in terms of is policy. Uh, a lot of our national policy, for most of you are aware, talks about prohibition of any development, any building within 100 to 300 meters of national monuments. Now, this is really being counterproductive for India. We've been uh, advocating that instead of prohibition, there should be many, many more incentives uh, for development of historic uh, urban cores, um, these incentives are totally missing in Indian policy uh, for historic for owners of historic buildings. Um, the second thing is, a lot of lot of uh, you know communities, um, even though they might be willing to um, you know make sure that the authenticity and the historic character is retained, do not have the technical knowledge nor means to get employ that technical knowledge. So one of the things cities. And uh, NGOs like ourselves and UNESCO need to emphasize on government is to provide that technical assistance uh, to, uh, to communities. And finally, point number three, uh, we need to demonstrate, and very kind of you for those remarks, Mike, but we need to, what, what we at the Aga Khan Trust for Culture are doing across Kabul, Lahore, Mali, Hyderabad, Cairo, Aleppo, and here in Delhi, is to implement, demonst implement projects that demonstrate the validity of the HUL approach. And, um, and for example, in Nizamuddin, we have now fixed about 60 monuments, not only the World Heritage Site of Hawaiian tomb. This led in uh, UNESCO in 2016, including uh, 14 additional buildings within the expanded World Heritage Site. We've created a city park of 90 acres uh, which was earlier inaccessible to the public within the buffer zone, and uh, 300,000 people came in last year. But most significantly, what we have done in the community of 20,000 people is we have built, provided health infrastructure, education, sanitation, created economic opportunities, waste collection. And this is every five years going back to the community to assess their needs and the impact of the project. So we've created economic opportunities and also because there is intangible heritage, created performance spaces and self-help. So these are really model projects that empower the community, follow the public-private partnership approach and build capacity within the community. Um, so those are the three things I wanted to say. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Rashid. That was really incredible. And um, I think that uh, what we're actually looking for is that beyond the monuments and the living city, which was mentioned by a number of people, that people are our best custodians of our heritage. So therefore, your activities in urban acupuncture, which I have actually visited, is really quite amazing. Our next speaker to come on board is then Sergio Vergara. He's the cultural secretary of the state of Puebla. I think what's really special about, again, is that we're looking at two aspects beyond the, beyond the monument. And here, um, Sergio has actually generated the concept of cultural corridors, taking on board 32 regions of Pueblo, and also looking at the intangible, which is another component part of the uh, historic urban landscape approach, a legacy of languages combining customs, traditions, and ancestral wisdom. Uh, Sergio, you have the screen. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure for us to be participating in this celebration of the 10th anniversary of the uh, HAL recommendation. I think that indeed uh, we have seen how important how important it is that we uh, that we preserve these ancient uh, uh, historic centres and uh, all centres in, in in across the world uh, that is part of the world heritage which we've got to carry on for uh, generations to come by protecting the old districts and by uh, by uh, preserving the heritage that we have in Puebla and other zones like this. So. Indeed, we do still have living uh, old historic centres, and we th they still are very much livable, and that's very much part of how they sh they can continue. The the uh, historic centre um, is. Um, the historic centers of, of, of Puebla are uh, very much uh, living areas, and we believe. That in these uh, old, in these, it's in these districts that our culture really survives. And we think that uh, we are able to actually um, promote our, our history and our culture through this. So we want to try and integrate. Uh, new orientations in of the new orientation of the urban landscape in the central in, as, the, as the center of our cultural heritage and I think where well, we've got to look at what it was in the past and what it can be in the future what's important is that we haven't actually lost the lifestyle of our societies that li people who live in these barrios, in these districts, who still have their fiestas, they still have their, their traditions, they still have their food, they still have their uh, tr their cultural traditions and their, their linguistic conditions that continue. And the, the, culture, the, the culinary co traditions are carried on in these areas. So these are the intangible cultural artefacts that we need to preserve. So. What we're trying to do is to try and recuperate the historical in, uh, identity of each area and try to uh, understand better what actually is at the base of this uh, unique heritage. And we're hoping that we can improve the conservation of this for uh, for, for, for the future by applying the Hull recommendation. The pandemic, of course, has actually um, affected us, where we've seen that it's in, sometimes in the old town um, we have lost the uh, visits, the visitors that we had in the past. We had a lot of students who were living in this area, and that's no longer the case. We have seen also that the churches uh, weren't uh, used or open as much as they were in the past, and that's also a shame. Um, so we are seeing that the pandemic has affected these uh, historic centres, even though people are still living there. The way in which they're living has changed. And we believe that we, we, we need to, to work to, to counter this after the pandemic.
we're seeing that uh, because of the pandemic, the people are actually moving from the old centres to the uh, outskirts of the cities. And um, this is a, a movement that we are uh, having to, to counter. But that is the context in which we are working and living in the historic centres right now. So, so the, the, the outskirts of the city are seen as an area that people uh, can escape out to. So there is actually a movement um, out to the outskirts of the city. So people are uh, living differently um, and we are seeing how this will impact upon the, the, cent the historic centres. But things are recuperating, or being, we are recuperating things in the in the old cent in the old centres. Um, people are now able to uh, live better. There, there's they're they're able. They're, we're seeing that the the old centres have been become much more sustainable. Uh, they're able to walk through the streets without uh, too much traffic. So it has actually given us a bit more, made the old centres a bit more breathable, and he, people uh, who live there are. are are, are happy to, to find their old centres again. So this is something which we've got to think about during this 10th anniversary period of the, the Hull recommendation. We've got to see how the old centres can be a little bit more um, human dimensioned. We've got to make sure that we integrate the socio-economic factor in our um, historic centres. Um, we want to return to this this people-centered city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio, for for that, and also um, uh, highlighting the issues of um, uh, changes which are taking place between the periphery and the city uh, centers, the historic centers. Our next speaker, without further ado, again is um, uh, Alpha Diop. He is the president of Ecomos Mali. Uh, Vice President of the ICOMOS International Chevalier de la Ordre National du Mali, and uh, again, the, the role of the advisory bodies of ICOMOS beyond World Heritage is very important, and we're here to listen to your words. Please, you have the screen. Alpha, so... Hello. Yes, we can. Can you speak up? Yes, a little bit more, please. We don't hear you yet. No, Navampar. On Anton Pa. Perhaps we come back to you. Uh, you can take no. a minute okay. to see. No. Alpha, are you? We can't hear you. No. Let's. Um, do you want to? I uh, just try and um, and turn off the uh, my microphone and then start again. Turn off and start. And it. Maybe, uh, Alpha, you may like to relaunch your computer. Let's see. Maybe you relaunch your computer and maybe, Mike, you can right. go to another yeah. person we'll and come go. back. I think uh, Alpha will restart his computer. We'll um, move on then to um, uh, Susan, Susan McDonald. We almost thought that she might be in her pajamas and we really recognize the fact of <laughs> She's on board uh, from Los Angeles at this uh, very, very early hour. And in fact, that the Getty Conservation Institute is committed to um, urban conservation in general and modern heritage in particular. And we're very, very pleased to welcome you um, on this um, on the panel. Uh, over to you, Susan. Uh, thanks so much, Mike, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here amongst um, today's august group of colleagues. I am joining you today, as Mike said, from the city of Los Angeles in California, and I acknowledge my presence on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples who stewarded this land through the generations. 
So to this question of what cities can do to implement the whole recommendation and respond to the call in practical terms, I focused in on some specific actions um, based on uh, past work that I have done um, with local governments to support their um, efforts to um, manage change in the historic, historic urban environment. And I had a series of specific actions as a result of that. So it seems to me that it really starts with the city generating enough interest and commitment to the basic ideas that are embraced in the whole um, approach and gathering the champions that can support this beyond the sort of usually overworked and under-resourced heritage advisor or planner. So generating interest really relies on, I think, having really simple, clear messages about why sustaining the historic urban landscape is important and how it can contribute to these broader social, cultural, environmentally and economic life of the city and align it with all the interrelated demands that they have to respond to the climate change emergency and sustainable development, which is now uh, such a priority. So I think having access to clearly communicated and immediately understandable examples targeted at local government is really key. Um, also creating networks and opportunities for cross city mentoring on different aspects of Hull would be a way to support individuals working in local government. It seems to me that we still need to develop um, more broadly the community of practitioners for Hull that can support these efforts. And it's great to see the increasing availability of material that local governments can access um, through efforts um, like the Canopy website and networks that UNESCO is creating through, gen through events such as these. Um, engaging with or better still developing partnerships with local communities, civil society groups and heritage groups in early discussions of the whole approach is an action to create a network of champions on the ground for such work, because as we know and has been said, this work is most successful when it happens bottom up and top down. Um, another action I always think is useful to do as a starting point is something akin to a SWOT analysis of what the city already has in place that can support the whole approach. How do these HALA processes line up with the city's existing regulatory framework, the range of financial, civil, civic engagement and planning processes and tools and practices, and whether they support the whole concept or might be a barrier to it? So where can the current policies, practices and process be adapted or retooled and where do new processes need to be introduced? And I think acknowledging what's already working well is a good strategy and being able to leverage off existing local practices is advantageous because we don't need to be reinventing the wheel when we don't have to. Another potential action that I think has become important recent, reminded me of the importance of it recently, is this need to undertake historic studies in advance of survey assessment and inventory work. And this is something that can be initiated uh, fairly autonomously by um, heritage players in local government. And I think it's important right now to be re-examining existing histories um, to ensure that recent history is included or that the history of, of the historic urban landscape is undertaken in ways that is inclusive and addresses past biases and un unrecognised and marginalised communities' histories are well understood. Historic studies are really important to provide context for the place-based work, but they're also a really important way to direct to to engage directly with local communities and organisations from the outset of the work. And they can be important starting point for acknowledging and understanding equity and social justice issues. My final point in the sort of rather grab, grab bag of, of actions is um, the importance of creating a vision. I think that idea of creating strong, compelling vision that can be shared by communities, governments and civil society groups for a city based on this understanding of the values, how they're vulnerable and the community's aspirations for the future and managing all the complexities of the historic urban landscape is an important way and helpful way to coalesce people um, around this common quest to sustain their unique uh, historic environment. I think that's probably, I should stop here for the reasons of time, but I wanted to say that the Getty Conservation Institute really welcomes and supports the World Heritage Center's call for action and looks forward to the ongoing work to operationalize and support um, historic urban landscape efforts around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for um, really uh, bringing together a lot of key points. I think one of the things which is now coming 
really a stranger and different sort of audiences and they're the partnerships and the practitioners. Uh, what um, Russell Galt from IUCN spoke about city shapers. And I think this is a, obviously a key, a key audience which we need to talk about. As for visions, Helmut Schmidt actually said that if I have a vision, I go to see my optometrist. So since then, I'm a little bit nervous about visions. However, let's move on. Uh, um, uh, we'll go to our next uh, um, uh, advisory body, Joe King. But Joe is very special. If we think that Paul started in 2005 with the Vienna Memorandum, it started much earlier with ICROM, with the Integrative Territorial Urban urban conservation program of 1995, which the late Herb Stobel, uh, Giuco Yocoletto and Joe were involved. And I think that uh, we're looking forward to hear exactly the context and the future of Hull uh, from you. Joe, please um, take the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And actually, thank you for thank you for recognizing that, because I do think um, and I, I won't take credit for it at all, but I do think my my uh, my former supervisor and, and friend, Yuko Yokileto, really started this process. And as you said, Herb Stovall was very much involved in it uh, from, the, from the beginning. And then it was taken up by UNESCO and Francesco Bandarin and Ron Van Ors, et cetera. So, um, so yes, in fact, the first thing I actually wanted to do was take the opportunity to congratulate UNESCO for this 10th anniversary of the Historic Urban Landscape Recommendation. Um, I, I confess that when we started working on this, uh, 15 years ago, as you say, 2005 with the Vienna Memorandum, I certainly could have never imagined that it would become a standard setting instrument that which is widely recognized around the world as a truly integrated approach to conservation of our, of our urban heritage. It's kind of interesting because when you start working on these kinds of recommendations and, and, and documents, you never know what kind of life they're ultimately going to take on. The fact of the matter is that uh, that uh, Hull has really actually uh, really been picked up and is actually really very widely, uh, I think, widely accepted. And I think that's something everyone should be very pleased about. Um, in terms of uh, actions uh, that city authorities or, or site managers can take in, in relation to Hull, I just today just have a couple of them. There are actually obviously many, many of them. And my good friend Susan actually just mentioned a couple of them uh, in her pre just previous presentation. But the two things that I would like to revolve, uh, to have my comments uh, revolve around are the first is the better involvement of people and communities in the planning process. Now, on the one hand, I'm happy to see that the idea of community involvement and uh, community consultation, participation, whatever word you want to use for it, has become widely accepted. That's certainly not the case uh, when I started studying at ECRUM in 1991, but you know, over these many years now, it has become accepted. And I was pleased, uh, since I took part in a number of the preparatory sessions um, that the rapporteurs are reporting on today, I was really happy to see that this issue of uh, community involvement uh, came out um, in a very strong way. It came out up front in most of the discussions in most of the regions uh, and the most of the regions concerned. Um, but having said that, um, I definitely want to recognize um, uh, my colleague from South Africa who spoke earlier very, very eloquently and much more eloquently than I can, um, because uh, I would argue that for the full Im implementation of HUL, uh, as a recommendation, we need to make sure that all people are able to provide inputs into the planning processes for the city. I think it's it's easy for us to talk about uh, community participation. It's easy, uh, especially for those people who have who have power or have uh, access to decision makers to be able to make their opinions known uh, through the participatory processes that usually get uh, put forward uh, in planning processes in cities. But um, it is much more difficult for those who are more marginalized and who do not feel comfortable um, uh, giving a voice to their concerns in the framework of a community meeting or some sort of public forum. It is really important for cities uh, and in particular site managers at World Heritage Sites to figure out ways to solicit input from various people, various communities within their properties. Now, I, I, there is no specific tool for doing this. Um, um, and it has to be designed depending on the specificity of a place, on the culture of the place, on the specific concerns of the place. But I think it is important for us 
to find the ways to make sure that these important viewpoints become part of the of the planning process of the whole process, um, and and that we and that, and that we have all of the relevant viewpoints that we need um, in order to to go forward. And as part of that, I would also argue that there's a there's a huge need for for skills in negotiation and in conflict resolution uh, to ensure that the final results can be acceptable by all. Um, you're always going to get different opinions coming from different groups of people and, 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 and different, uh, different communities with different interests. And ultimately, for Hull to work as a process, we need to be able to, uh, to negotiate or to, to foster negotiations, I would say, and be able to um, uh, and, and be able to ensure that we have conflict resolution. Um, secondly, um, and I'll close in just a, a minute, I want to expand this beyond uh, the community uh, level, and I also want to talk about another group of stakeholders, and those are institutional stakeholders, because another thing we need to expand ourselves in is we need to open up to a wider range of institutional stakeholders. We are usually talk about national heritage agencies and city administrations. But if you think about the complexity of institutional actors that exist in a territory, it's, it's much more complex. Um, and we need to be talking to uh, um, people such as housing authorities, the environmental authorities, water authorities, waste disposal authorities, and in some specific cases, like a port authority, if, this is a, if it's a city that, that, that has a port. Because each of those has often independent authority over parts of what it is that they're doing. And so what we need to do is we need to be able to bring also all of those voices together. And um, my suggestion, and I'll, I'll conclude with this, is that I think that World Heritage Sites and World Heritage Site managers can play an important role in this. And in fact, they can even be seen as the useful tool for bringing all of these people together. Because the fact that something is declared World Heritage means that everyone recognizes that and they all understand that they need to, you know, that they need to do something in this place. So I would argue that World Heritage sites and site managers could be that central piece for bringing together the discussions with our institutional stakeholders and with our and with our, our various communities. So with that, I will um, I will give you the floor back and, and thank you very much for, for letting me speak today. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, uh, I will. Um, uh, do we have Alpha back on board? No, not yet. Not yet. Okay, so we'll then move on. Um, our next speaker, uh, uh, Marie Noel Tourneur. She is, um, as mentioned before, that she is at the um, Category Two Center. Another important uh, role of the um, within the uh, the family of um, activities of UNESCO, and uh, is also part of the Asia and Pacific, uh, where they've got a major examples. One uh, tends to think about it in very different ways. I've gradually proposed that we should move and recall and rename the historic urban landscape to the historic urban Shanshui. This is something perhaps we should take on board and uh, begin to then understand uh, cross-cultural implication. Marie Noel, you have the screen. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, I'd like to, to thank uh, Jody Osraga, the, the, the centre, for uh, inviting WeCup to, to, to join. And it really feels like a big um, family, family reunion. Um, so the question, what are the key actions that a city, city authorities and site managers can, can take? Um, first of all, cities are really key uh, because there's a general decentralization process in, in the world. So they are really, really main actors, some hyperactive because they're super, when I mean, they are the wealth of the country or some of the more depressed economies. I I've sort of thought of keywords for action and I chose values and continuity. Um, Mike, you took the words out of my mouth when you quoted Article 5.1 of the World Heritage Convention. And, and really this, this uh, mention of, of uh, planning, including planning processes and looking at the function of heritage in the life of the community. And that is absolutely vital. And if we look at the HUL, I mean, you could choose several quotes, um, but I think one of the, of the key ones is, is looking at, in the preamble, the principle of sustainable development 
provides for the preservation of existing resources, the active protection of urban heritage and its sustainable management is a condition sine qua non of development. Heritage preserves a sine qua non condition for development that is extremely important if we want to overcome the distinction between development and conservation. Again, if we look at the word landscape, and there's sometimes a lot of confusion with the word, we're looking at an ecosystem. It's, it's from above. It's the geographer's perspective. It's not a category, but urban landscape can be a category, can be a, a, a value. It's not just the reduce, it's really understanding the, the layers. So if we if we come back to the identification of cultural, I mean the values, okay, so we say that all the time, but what cultural, natural, tangible, movable, immovable, intangible values, but more specifically, what are the, the, the carriers of those values? The feature, if we want to, to protect things, we have to know what we are protecting. So that's really important. And another point is flipping the coin to figure out how values can allow for urban development. I've got a whole, my whole list here. Um, and it means because we can be looking at interesting qualities, how can values help to build a better uh, development design? How can we fight uh, ill development? How can we invent new economic models depressed economy. So again, it's it's really flipping the coin. And this is, and I know, Mike, you said you're not very too comfortable with the term vision, but let's say if we're looking at the, the broader political aspect in the sense of politics as good governance, it's developing a vision in the sense of perspective, the, the project, and that's the responsibility of, of city leaders. I mean, that, that good word of shipping, shaping the city, responding to needs. Okay, what's the project for the city? Uh, if we don't want to have just mono activity in tourism, uh, housing, diversity of commerce, transport at a broader scale for small cities, meaning they can be a network within more different cities at a, at a more territorial scope, or for huge mega metropolises. And that's also. And that's what the, the SDGs come in, or the, the urban agenda, if you want to refer to this um, big international document, is, I mean, ill development in the sense of the financial ill development, uh, because that also a main, a main pressure, how, how to fight and convince and flip the coin. So that can also be regulatory systems, because um, consensus sometimes has to be framed by tools. So again, the, the other point I, I want to, to focus on, again, it, Hull is not a doxa, but it's in itself a proposal that is a tool. And the work uh, undertaken with the, the World Heritage Center in, in uh, 2020, the Foucault meeting also proposed steps. And, and I mean, I'm not going to list them, but this are you know, governance structure, sustainable development, mapping, survey, assessing vulnerability. So there's there are eight. So I'm just saying the same thing all of the others said, but just slightly differently. But again, looking at the general landscape. And one of the issues for world heritage is, in a way, and, and the sense is going to hate me for saying this, but it's just another layer. But it has specific requirements and responsibility of the state. But if we look at the values all over, how can we layer again? these different elements and ensure the continuity between both. That means Thank if you want to do new development, you look at the values. What else Thank you. Here. <laughs> that was great. I think you're reinforcing it and that uh, um, Paul has got a, um, a global, um, a global uh, um, a re outreach, which is really critical. It's not just sort of comes from one particular place. And I think this was important. 
We say last but not least, we say habub in uh, in uh, that uh, the person is who wraps up is uh, our special person. And here we um, we have um, Ibrahim Al Khalifa from the Arab Regional Center for World Heritage. We had the opportunity in Bahrain to see the how in fact urban um, uh, historic urban landscape in visiting Maharag, the which in uh, in uh, Bahrain. This was something very special and and the. Category two center uh, supports the urban regeneration and historic um, cities in the Arab region. So, um, Ibrahim, you have uh, you have the screen. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. And I would like to start by congratulating uh, UNESCO and the World Heritage Center on the anniversary of the hard recommendation and this initiative to launch this series of webinars to really discuss the future of the hard recommendation. Looking at the question how uh, authorities and the site managers can really move forward with recommendations and uh, on the site level, I would like to point out a number of aspects and uh, to start with the engagement of the local communities in the regeneration and planning of cities. Of course, there are, there are a number of ways to do that, but I think from what we have seen over the course of, of this webinar is that the best practices often uh, showcase the private-public partnership, which of course offers incentives for people and opportunities towards improving the infrastructure of cities through the protection of cultural heritage. This really reflects positively on maintaining the spirit of cities and its urban fabric, and really fulfills the goals of the HAL approach of inclusiveness and the protection of cultural heritage in general. I would also like to share the example of the burning path in the city of Maharag, as you have mentioned, in Bahrain, where the Arab Regional Center for Heritage is based in, we have seen that since its inscription, it had a positive impact in keeping the local communities convinced to keep living in the city and thriving in the city, since they have seen that the rehabilitation projects had a significant improvement on their living conditions. And the infrastructure of the city has improved significantly after its, after its inscription. What is also remarkable is that people who moved out in the past to modern cities chose to return to live in the old city, which also shows the importance of the emotional attachment that people have to the places where they lived in, to the cities that they lived in the past. Another factor that I would like to discuss is assessing the socioeconomic benefits of cultural tourism in urban heritage cities. The pressure it creates with a large number of visitors affecting the local populations and affecting the traditional livelihoods. And despite those challenges I mentioned um, regarding tourism, it still remains a powerful tool to promote cultural awareness and knowledge on the protection of heritage. In addition to the economic benefits it generates over time, it can also support authorities in generating funding and influencing policymakers into prioritizing the preservation of the urban fabric of cities. Again, I think uh, the constant conflict always is between development and the preservation of historical cities. And that can be only done through dialogue or through involving all the stakeholders into the discussion to make sure that everyone is involved in any future plans of regeneration of those cities. I would also like to conclude by pointing out on the important role that the HAR recommendation has on the post recovery of cultural heritage in the Arab region specifically, especially looking back at the damages that, more, that many of the cities in the Arab region faced over the last 10 years. Again, I would like to thank everyone for this opportunity, and uh, I wish that we can continue our discussions in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ibrahim. Um, I think that we now have, um, do we have uh, um, Alpha yes. Diop? Yes, we Alpha do. is connected. We just have to see if his microphone works. <laughs> Alpha Diop, Alezi, s'il vous plaît. Monsieur Diop? Mr. Diop, are you able to hear us? Is your microphone on? Maybe your microphone is not working. We are not able to hear you, Mr. Diop. 
We, uh, but this is, um, Jyoti, this is not the, uh, the last of the, uh, the activities. Hall is moving on and we're going to have the great opportunity to have lots, lots more voices at the next session. So um, we will be able to organize that. Yeah. Yes, we will okay. uh, find another way to include uh, Mr. Diop, your words. In any case, we will have uh, a concluding uh, document. We will have some outputs from this event. And we will be sure to include your words in this. We are very sorry. And please go ahead and put some notes in the chat if you'd like, so everybody can at least get a sense of what you wanted to say. We are very sorry to have not been able to make this work. But this is the sadness of, uh, you know, it's both the power and the disappointment of technology that it uh, fails us when we need it most sometimes. Well, just to give a, before just a closing sentence, I think that uh, we've had some uh, amazing ideas which have come about, and I don't think that it, it would be uh, do justice to uh, just to pick one or two or cherry pick some of the ideas. Uh, but one thing which has come out, which is so important, that is beyond heritage. It's beyond everything is then bringing on board um, new mechanisms, new ideas, new peoples. And I think that this is where we will be regenerating the uh, the historic urban uh, landscape approach, bringing it new relevance, uh, especially as the last uh, the next uh, decade is the decade of action for the sustainable development goals. And I think that the historic urban landscape approach is going to be a major player in bringing together the issues of um, saving our cultural and heritage, uh, natural heritage within. Um, these activities. Over to you, Jyoti. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mike, for so ably leading this roundtable, which was by no means an easy task. Uh, and many, many thanks to all of the speakers. There's just so much wealth of ideas and perceptions, thoughts. Uh, it's been very, very important for us and help uh, will help us a lot in in putting together uh, these ideas and going forward. We have made an attempt to do a preliminary um, sort of uh, a set of ideas that we've tried to pull together. But before we, we go there, I'd like to uh, take a little break with another video that we have from the city of Queretaro. La zona de monumentos. The historic center of monuments in Querétaro is uh, one that is an art, uh, and you can see the subtitles. En 1996, la Convención sobre la Protección del Patrimonio Mundial, Cultural y Natural, inscribió en la lista del Patrimonio Mundial a la zona de monumentos históricos de Querétaro, siendo un ejemplo excepcional de antigua ciudad colonial que conserva la traza urbana inicial que trazaron los pueblos originarios y el establecimiento de las primeras edificaciones españolas. En la ciudad de Querétaro se destaca el alto grado de conservación de la arquitectura barroca en edificios civiles y religiosos ornamentados. En una época dorada en los siglos XVII y XVIII, los barrios tradicionales de origen indígena conforman la ciudad fundacional a partir del Cerro del Sangremal, ahora plaza fundacional. Fundadores. El trazado urbano es único e irrepetible en América, ya que conservó en el horizonte del paisaje de la ciudad la traza originaria con calles pequeñas, angostas y sinuosas donde vivía la población indígena y otra traza rectilínea destinada a los colonos españoles y que convivían en la misma ciudad, destacándose la sencilla arquitectura mestiza y la suntuosa arquitectura europea. En el paisaje histórico urbano nos encontramos con el río Querétaro, que viene de la zona de la Cañada y cruza la ciudad de oriente a poniente, siendo actualmente un corredor vial de comunicación para los ciudadanos. El acueducto de Querétaro con sus 74 arcos y una longitud de casi un kilómetro y medio. También se encuentra una de las alamedas con mayor superficie en América Latina, la Alameda Hidalgo, de finales del siglo XVIII, nuestra plaza de armas, el centro político administrativo del Estado, el magnífico Jardín Guerrero, sede de los eventos culturales como el Hey Festival Internacional. Santiago de Querétaro, a 10 años de la recomendación del paisaje histórico urbano. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, after uh, thank you. Thank you to the city of Querétaro. After all this, um, this discussion, all the ideas that have been put on the table um, and from the case studies, uh, the, the preliminary technical sessions, the rapporteurs, uh, all of the ideas of the round table, 
the statements from the mayors yesterday and uh, the previous sessions, uh, the statements from the experts uh, yesterday, we have tried to put together um, all of these ideas using the mirror board with my colleagues and try to make some sense of it. And uh, what I'm going to do now is, uh, you know, sort of the preliminary share with you the preliminary set of um, of 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 notes that we pulled together. Maybe Carlota, if you could show us uh, the different uh, sessions before, and then we can yes and then come back to this one that uh, we, so if we could look at some of the other boards and how we're pulling together. Um, so we've basically taken points from each of the different sessions and also from the previous um, events that we have uh, been having the city labs, as I told you, and seen that certain themes, certain ideas have recurred uh, several times. So as you can see, we're going a little bit slowly through these so you can see yourself um, balancing con conservation in a living city, historic materials, high quality public spaces, integration with urban planning, holistic planning, community engagement, stakeholder cooperation, surrounding landscapes. Um, maybe we go back now to see we have climate action, more on green spaces. So the sizes also indicate the number of times uh, that certain points came up and we've tried to categorize them using these different uh, uh, boxes, so to say. And uh, what we have arrived at is, uh, is sort of this uh, broad set of points that we will, uh, you know, this is a preliminary set of points that we will then synthesize further, listening again to all of the notes and record, listening again to all of the recordings and going back over our notes. So I just want to share with you these preliminary points so that we then uh, go further to synthesize them. We saw primarily a few themes that kept emerging, and that's how we were looking at these categories. The first is around governance, looking at the aspect of intersectoral management, the need for different uh, sectors to be engaged, uh, coordination and integration, integrating within the um, planning processes, the need for strengthening partnerships, management frameworks, management plans, and anchoring the management plans within the city development plans, urban planning and legislative uh, frameworks, the need to strengthen legislative frameworks. So this seemed to be one set of uh, themes and ideas, points around this uh, that came up. The second in looking at the implementation of uh, whole in cities uh, is uh, the idea of financing in terms of being able to develop sustainable funding frameworks, uh, looking at private public partnerships and blended finance. Um, this is also something that had come up in previous uh, uh, World Heritage City Lab, uh, look, blended finance as in looking at blending private and public uh, finance mechanisms. Um, and innovative financing, which is uh, really at the very heart of it's it's one of the four tools of you know in new financial tools that are required as part of the uh, HUL recommendation text. Um, and then we have a, a set of points around uh, that have come up around conserving urban places. This includes adaptive reuse, the emphasis on mixed use conservation and regeneration, looking at how to mix old and new, um, the need to inventory and map in detail, paying attention to traditional architecture, traditional materials and building techniques, preserving the different layers, which is again very fundamental to the whole approach, the quality of the built environment and looking at high quality built environment, and looking at active and accessible public spaces. So ensuring this, especially in the context of uh, COVID and, in, and, uh, and uh, uh, looking at enhancing the livability of places. Then we have a whole set of points around inclusion and, and uh, participatory planning, which was a very strong theme 
that ran through uh, many of the presentations and many of the points raised by uh, different uh, experts. The emphasis on diverse communities, on a people-centered approach, on participatory decision-making, the need for, for strategies for community engagement, including digital and new technologies, um, including for youth. Uh, this was something that has come up in previous sessions as well. Um, sustainable tourism, uh, which includes looking at uh, the benefits to local communities, sustainable local economic development and livelihood generation, emphasis on small businesses, and uh, the inclusion of intangible cultural heritage, which is a, a theme, again, that has recurred many, many times. And uh, finally, I think one set of points have, uh, that have come up uh, repeatedly has been around making cities more green and resilient, that including uh, nature and natural environment as an integral part of managing the cultural heritage is very critical so that the emphasis on green spaces, on integrating natural values, connection with the uh, the territory or the region and the landscape, um, relating it to climate action and eco-sensitive um, approaches, sustainable infrastructure or green infrastructure. Um, emphasis also on mobility so that pedestrianization and um, non-motorized uh, uh, mobility is emphasized, uh, resilience and recovery is at the heart of uh, this and the emphasis on disaster risk reduction, which is again, uh, something that's very, uh, not necessarily only about making it green and resilient, but resilience in general. Um, and then waste and water management as you know, the infrastructure management, again, looking at green infrastructure management. So these, I think, are the key themes. Key themes. I don't know if my colleagues can remind me if I missed anything. Um, Alba, Carlota, did I miss anything? Or we've covered most of the points. And certainly we will be revisiting these and coming back to, uh, to further uh, 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 elaborate these and uh, further distill them to arrive at some key actions. Because in the end, when we look at how whole can be implemented by cities, we really need to think what is it that's what actions do cities need to take in order to be able to implement uh, the whole recommendation because it's one thing to have a set of principles and another to really look at how to to operationalize them so i will uh, stop here and uh, hope that this gives us uh, some further food for thought and uh, um, i want to just take a minute now to we're already 10 minutes over Maybe I just stop to see for one minute if there are any uh, pressing questions or points anybody would like to raise because we didn't have much time for discussion, unfortunately. And then after that, I would like to move uh, to close the session. Any questions or comments? I see none at all. I think perhaps everybody is quite tired. It's been a long and intense session and we will continue. I mean, this is just uh, part of the conversation. Please do stay in touch with us and work with us through the um, urban notebooks and further sessions. Meanwhile, I want to take the opportunity before I, I move to the last set of uh, films to thank once again all of our partners. Uh, we've had, uh, we did not do this alone. Uh, I want to thank the city of Querétaro in Mexico, uh, the Secretaria de Cultura del Gobierno de Estado de Puebla, Mexico, uh, Regional World Heritage Institute Zacatecas, Mexico, the Austrian Federal Ministry for Arts, Culture, Civil Service and Sport, the city of Graz in Austria, the city of Salzburg in Austria, Historic England and the United Kingdom, the Association of Italian World Heritage Properties, the city of San Gimignano in Italy, the city of Nanjing in China, 
UNESCO Regional Bureau for Science and Culture in Europe and the UNESCO National Office to Mexico. Thank you very much for your support, your collaboration that was very precious and made this event possible. I want to thank also uh, the technical team who have worked amazingly with us and worked extremely hard to make this such a smooth event and thank the interpreters who have been with us for all of these different sessions. Many thanks to you. Most of all, I would like to invite my colleagues who have been behind the scenes. You see my face, but it is a whole group of people who have been working with extreme dedication for months and have had many sleepless nights. Please, Alba, Carlota, um, Darmila, Iman, Federico, Jamel, please turn on your cameras. Thank you very much for all of your hard work. And I'd like to invite everyone to have a quick round of applause for you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to move now to close with the um, two last videos. One is uh, Pianza in Italy and the other is from Hue in Vietnam. Thank you all very much for your participation and many, many thanks uh, for your engagement and your contributions. Thank you and goodbye. We have the videos now.
believe the city of San Gemignano has another uh, video. I'm just checking if uh, this one was not scheduled, but uh, we just want to make sure if you have already received it. Can you uh, confirm? If you allow me, I can share the screen. Okay, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you Thank all you so very much. much. And I hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. Thank you again to the interpreters who have stayed so late for us. Thank you so much. Bye. And thanks also again to the technicians and to the great team. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you.